Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the February 8th meeting of the USD 305 Board of Education. Please uh, stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Thank you. Before we begin our meeting tonight, I wanted to address just a few things real quick regarding our Board of Education. Our Board of Education is elected by the members of our community. The seven of us are elected to conduct the business of the USD 305. We are to conduct that business during a meeting that is to be held in a way that the public is entitled, entitled to observe it. Okay. There are many times during our meeting when we allow the public to make a presentation to the seven of us. This time is intended for citizens to speak to us and present things. It's not a time for conversation or those things. It's a time for someone to present to our group. Each board member comes to this meeting as an individual, independent thinker, and through collaboration and communication, we develop the policy for the USD 305 administration. Our board members are not tasked with the day-to-day -day operations of the district or schools. Rather, our board ensures that highly qualified staff are in place to act on the mission of the board and carry out the policies of our board. Tonight, we will not allow, or I will not allow, public comment on any of the agenda items this evening. If the public has additional comments for board members, I would ask that they submit those comments in writing or contact board members directly. We will now move on to the approval of the agenda. Mr. President, I move we approve the agenda as presented. Mr. Grant, uh, do we have a second? Second. Second. Ann Zimmerman. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. The next item on our agenda is presentations and recognitions with Jennifer Kamian. We're going to start this evening with You Make a Difference Awards. The You Make a Difference Award is presented to staff members whose exemplary actions support students, colleagues, and the mission of Salina Public Schools. Recipients of these awards receive a lapel pin and a handwritten note personally delivered by a Board of Education member. Shanna Pittenger, English teacher, South High School. Along with her partner, Ryder, Shanna greets students in the hall each day. Together, they help students and staff relax and laugh because of Ryder's happy and nurturing demeanor. The 75-pound brown standard poodle senses if a student is upset and helps calm them by climbing into their lap. Thank you, Shanna and Ryder, for encouraging smiles and laughs and making a difference. Jocelyn Arnold, math teacher, South High School. Jocelyn has taken on an extra role during ELO. She keeps tabs on freshmen needing extra support in science, social studies, and math, distributes passes, and stays current in these different disciplines in order to help the students. By handling the freshman response to intervention program, she directly helps students find success in their first year of high school. Thank you for making a difference. Amy Counts, School Nurse Coordinator, Lakewood Middle School. Described by a colleague as a compassionate leader and a tireless worker, Amy has gone above and beyond, especially since the pandemic. She supervises district nurses, is the Lakewood School Nurse, and led the Test to Stay program. Amy's guidance, persistence, empathy, and willingness to roll up her own sleeves sets her apart. Thank you, Amy, for making a difference. Doug Stein, Facility Manager at Central High School. Doug would be recognized by anyone working at Central High. He is regularly in hallways, keeping Central in pristine condition. Doug's staff, building teachers, and administrators count on his outstanding communication. He is always available by email or phone. Doug's positivity and grace are appreciated by his coworkers. 
Thank you, Doug, for making a difference. And now we'll move on to our Horizon Awards. Teachers who have demonstrated excellence during their first full year of teaching are nominated to be District Horizon teachers. From those nominations, one secondary and one elementary teacher are chosen. We are proud to announce this year's Horizon Award recipients, Cole Dow and Lindsay Chavez. Cole Dow, as our secondary Horizon teacher, is now in his second year as welding instructor at Central High School. Cole's classroom is a place where students are not afraid to take risks and become more prepared to enter the welding industry after high school. I now invite Cole to the podium. Thank you. Board members, parents, staff, everybody, I do appreciate this award that you've uh, presented and bestowed upon me. My students are the ones who actually are the ones who are behind this. Because when Lynn walked in and said, hey, Mr. Dow, I literally thought I was fired. <laughs> I seen her walk in, and I was like, oh, no. But then she said, I'm getting an award. And I'm like, what? Teachers get awards? So it's really my students who have made this possible. I'm a 24-year Army veteran, and I've taken this chance to come over on this, this side of the house, and they've really educated me on what they want in their life. That's been proven point fact that the first year I've had 18 direct hires into our community. So that's 18 more direct people are gonna stay here, make a career in Salina. And I say a career in Salina, that's our future people. That's our future board. That's our future parents. The next group is all those parents out there. Please keep supporting them. My welding program went from 120 to 174. I would love to see 200 next year. So if you got some freshmen coming up and in, bring them. You got people who are kids who are just wanting to get an experience on it, send them over. I do not want to see any one of my students ever say super size with fries, okay? That's number one. And lastly, board, thank you. All right, I know I put a lot out there on not only my, my administration, but my, my, my board members as well by requesting a lot of funds get pumped into us. But I hope by placing ninth out of 400 that you know I'm, I'm legit, okay? My students listen. I've had two accidents, minor burn and a kid caught his hair on fire. <laughs> so if that's my two accidents for the two years I've been here, so be it but we're going to go to Missouri and take on some pipe welding as well. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Lindsay Chavez, our Elementary Horizon teacher, teaches fourth grade at Sunset Elementary School. Lindsay teaches and builds relationships from the heart, is collaborative, organized, and offers a calming presence. Now I would invite Lindsay to the podium. I would like to start by saying that today I asked my class to give me some advice for public speaking. Um, the first thing is think about your favorite candy and color, so Almond Joy and Red. Um, take deep breaths, and it's just me talking in here right now. Um, don't think too much. Drink a cup of coffee before I go and stay calm. And the faster I read, the faster I get it over with. So um, fourth grade advice. Um, but I want to say, first off, I'm honored to be nominated and receiving this award. Um, I've been super grateful to be surrounded by staff, friends, and family. Um, I've had tons of opportunities to learn and grow as a teacher. I'm really enjoying finding my duties and um, making relationships with my students, my fifth grade, well, fourth graders last year, now fifth graders still come and see me every day. I love the class I have now, um, and I'm super excited to watch them grow and continue my career here in USD 305, so thank you. In 
In recognition of the awards, Lindsay and Cole are presented engraved plaques and apple pins. <laughs> Their pictures have been placed in the hallway of recognition just outside this room. Congratulations. Please allow the board to congratulate you. This evening, we will also be recognizing the Superintendent Excellence Awards, our first group of awards goes to band state qualifiers at Central High School. Guillermo Rodriguez is the Central High Band Director. Will you please join Superintendent X-Line in the front? And will all the band students please line up next to them? We're calling for Central High School band students. As I call your name, please step towards Superintendent X-Line so you can receive your award. At that time, if parents would like to take a picture, stand up and we'll pause for a photo. And special thanks this evening to our South High School photography intern, Ariana Nunez, who will take a picture of each presentation. Central had two state band qualifiers. They were Andrew Fields, senior, State Jazz Band on trombone. Corbin, Corbin Banninger, sophomore, State 56A Band on percussion. Please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now. And our next group of awards goes to choir state qualifiers at South High School. Eddie Creer Jr. is the vocal music director. Will you please join Superintendent X-Line in the front? And will all the music students please line up next to them? Congratulations to the following who were selected to the KMEA All-State Choir. Kirsten Lamia, sophomore. Jalen Gutierrez, senior. Please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now. Our next group of awards goes to theater state qualifiers at South High School. Kate Lindsay is the South High Theater Director. Will you please join Superintendent X-Line in the front and will all the theater students please line up next to them. We're calling for South High School Theater. Salina South's Thespian Troupe received several honors at the 2022 Kansas State Thespian Festival. They once again received a Gold Honor Troupe Award for successfully completing the set of criteria, which includes community service activities, fundraisers, touring productions, and other activities. 
Thespian Troop members, Mia Dennett, Sr. <laughs> Melina Zindlar, Jr. And we have Cadence Dickinson, Cameron Preble, Emily Streeter, Ethan Lehner, and Yesenia Torres. Would you please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now? Next, we recognize orchestra state qualifiers at Central High School. Lindsay Modine is the orchestra director. Will you please join Superintendent Eckline in the front? And Central High School had one orchestra student. Congratulations, Armando Duran, sophomore, was chosen on viola. Would you please? Next, we recognize choir state qualifiers at Central High School. Ryan Holmquist is the vocal music director. Will you please join Superintendent X line in the front? And will all the music students please line up next to them? As I call your name. As I call your name, please step toward Superintendent X line so you can receive your award and then remain standing in the line afterward. Congratulations to the following students who were selected to the KMEA 2022 All-State Choir. They will perform with the All-State Choir at Century 2 Concert Hall in Wichita on February 26th. Choir students are Israel Barlow, Sr. <laughs> Chloe Chesney, Jr. Cassidy Cottingham, Sr. <laughs> Chloe Highsmith, Jr. <laughs> Harper Johnston, Jr. <laughs> Emma Kelly, Sr. Lillian Myers, Sr. Jackson Rutz, Sophomore. Josh Warner, Sr. Peyton Wood, Sr. Please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now. Our next group of awards goes to debate state qualifiers at South High School. The South High debate team is coached by Megan Hegeman. Will you please join Superintendent Xline in the front? And will all the debate students please line up next to them as well? 
And as I call your name, please step toward Superintendent Excellence. You can receive your award. All the South High School debate students. The following students were novice state debaters. Grady Smith, freshman. Elizabeth Lovett, freshman. Kaizen Snow, freshman. Grady, Elizabeth, and Kaizen also placed in four-speaker state debate. Sophia Burns, freshman. Four-speaker state debate. Francisco Guadardo, junior. Soren Matabach, sophomore. Soren Manabak, sophomore. <laughs> Francisco and Soren also placed fourth in two speaker state debate. Two speaker state debate, Seth Carter, senior, placed fourth. <laughs> Ava Williamson, Lillian Ardis, Nardisela Garcia, also placed. Would you please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now? Our next group of awards goes to Art State Qualifiers at Central High School, Salina High School Central. Our teachers with honorees are Larry Collins, Kirsten Dykes, and Irma Garcia. Will you please join Superintendent X Line in the front? Will all the art students please line up as well? <laughs> students, as I call your name, please step toward Superintendent X Line. And then when you're finished receiving your certificate, you can go back to the end of the line. Salina High School Central Art students were honored at the prestigious 2022 Scholastic Art Awards at Wichita's Mary R. Koch Arts, Arts Center, Mark Arts. The exhibit opens Friday, February 18th, and will be on view until March 26. Competition honorees. Lena Kennard, Sr., Abigail Henning, Sr. Araceli Segura. Teresa Grathwall. Michael Grotzinger. Emmy Holler, Camilla Lopez, Faith Rost, Mariah Prophet. Lillian Lamarca, Claire Renfro, please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now.
Our last group of awards this evening goes to theater state qualifiers at Central High School. Barb Hilt is the Central High Theater Director. Will you please join Superintendent Exline in the front? Will all the theater students please line up next to them? <laughs> Cast of Tracks. First place, chapter select, one act, and qualifying for the International Thespian Festival were Lillian Myers, senior. <laughs> Josh Warner, senior. <laughs> Ethan Henry, senior. Chloe Highsmith, Jr. <laughs> Charles Goldbach, Sr. <laughs> Peyton Wood, Sr. <laughs> Tyler Campbell, Sr. Vidi Bakta, Sr. Harper Johnston, Jr. Camille Morris, Jr. Emma Kelly, Sr. Would you please allow the Board of Education to congratulate you now? It's great when we get to recognize and celebrate many of the good things going on with the students within USD 305. The next item on our agenda this evening is the consent agenda, which includes minutes of the January 11th, 2022 regular meeting, the personnel report, the financial reports, including the January bills list, the December treasurer's report, the December investment report the December journal entries, to improve the encumbrance listings, to matter surfaces in the amount of $20,304.39 for a gym floor covering at Central High School, to Curriculum Associates Incorporated in the amount of $42,460.32 for the purchase of iReady reading program for the elementary buildings, to approve Hageman and Husner Elementary roof bid, to Geisler Roofing and Home Improvement in the amount of $756,469.73, to approve audit, an audit contract with Agler Gattert Chartered in the amount of $20,350. $20, this is the second year of a six year agreement to approve a CKCIE gift acceptance for adaptive equipment at an estimated cost of $10,645 and to approve a gift acceptance from the Salina Family YMCA for the purchase of additional playground equipment to Coronado Elementary, Metal Arc Elementary, and Sunset Elementary at an estimated cost of $50,000. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? President, I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Motion from Dr. Bandre, second, second from Mr. Grant. All in favor, please signal by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. 
The next item on our agenda this evening is public forum. We do have quite a few people here who've requested to speak at public forum. Um, with the amount and the amount on our agenda, we will be giving 60 seconds for uh, comments for people speaking during public forum. Let's see here. The first person we have on for public forum is uh, Dalton McDowell. Dalton, if you would mind coming up here. Dalton, on your request to uh, speak with us this evening, you did uh, have a couple of items that are listed as agenda items, so if you could limit your comments, please, to SROs. The other items are agenda items. I do have one thing to read real quick before you do that. You've already, I know you've already read the guidelines for citizens' participation. At this time, we will have public forum, and I'd like to go over the guidelines real quick. Public forum is a non-action item on our agenda. The board appreciates patrons taking time to share with us about their thoughts and concerns. Public forum is a time for comment on non-agenda items. Comment on agenda items are not being heard this evening. This is not an appropriate time or place for patrons to make comments of a personal nature about any district employee or student. Persons making such comments, which violate the privacy rights of district employees and students, will be asked to stop speaking and cease their remarks. If a patron or parent has a concern with one or more employees, our board will refer that person to the appropriate supervisor or superintendent for further review. Please understand that it is not our practice to respond during public forum comments or questions. Okay, Mr. McDowell, 60 seconds, go ahead. Okay. Um, we, of course there's security here tonight. My deal is I have no, I pay attention to the police scanner and stuff. Salina Public Schools has not uh, less than half their buildings are secured with SROs. There's one SRO for two buildings for secured. I don't think I'm going to say which ones, but one of those buildings, and you guys know, um, it seems like about once a month to sometimes once a week that they're calling in units, patrol units, so not the SROs, due to not having enough, I don't know what's going on at that building. I'm not gonna state, I know what building it is. Um, what is this, and I know Central had a, almost had a major incident a couple years ago. What, when will we look at possibly adding, I hate, more security, even if it's not law enforcement, security personnel to our district buildings. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. Appreciate Next, we have Cheryl Hart. Cheryl, you've asked to speak to us tonight about public forum. Yes, I did. So, thank you. Do you need me to go over this? Pardon me? There we go. Uh, do we need to go over the statement or anything again, or are you familiar with that at this point? No, I'm familiar with that. Okay, thank okay. you. Aware of it. Uh, your guidelines that you have stated before us usually gives us three minutes, and you say that you don't need to respond to any of our questions. Parents need time to have the school board answer questions and besides emails and appointments, because the emails and the appointments don't seem to solve our problems or help any resolve. As a group, we need discussion. We need the school board as a whole, and you give us three minutes and tonight, 60 seconds, which I think is uncalled for, uh, to long enough discuss our concerns. I am asking that you provide a slot on your calendar once every quarter so that we as parents and grandparents and great-grandparents can get together with you and discuss, discuss, I mean discuss, I don't mean you guys sit there and be quiet while we sit here and voice our concerns. We take time to come here. We need some time directly to have communication with you. Thank you, Ms. Harp. 
Okay, next we have uh, David Norland. Mr. Norland, thank you. Would you like me to go over the ground rules that I laid out earlier? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, it can't escape notice that the recent attempts to ban a book from the library and hold the library Mr. Norland, I'm sorry, that's one of our action items this evening, so that's something we... So my topic was a plan for unity. And what we're asking for as a group of people who have appeared here uh, partly in response to what we consider attacks on the school and the school board, is to say that we've never been less polarized because a, this group of us are standing up for gay, bi, trans, non-binary, people of color, etc., uh, because their lives and dignity do matter. And the changes to curriculum that are mentioned are a direct threat to those people. So we're incre increasingly unwilling to keep comfortable, normal relationships with those who insist on treating brothers and sisters as if their lives don't matter. Because we know that even though, all right, I'll send you an email. Thank you, Mr. Norman. <laughs> Next we have Jessica Hinton, Ms. Hinton. Ms. Hinton, if, do you need me to review the, the ground rules we had for public forum tonight? Okay, and it, your comment says that you want to submit documents for the record. Um, those documents, are they related to the discussion agenda or action agenda tonight? They are, but I'm not presenting them while talking about the agenda. I just want you guys to have them. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jessica Hinton. I'm a resident here in Salina. I am presenting the board with a binder full of information for review and to be reflected on the record. Please consider looking at some of the information I have presented to you. I even took the time to highlight some very important conclusions and article takeaways. While this is not the preferred method of delivery, I feel like some individuals of this governing body are disregarding any input from citizens in the community by not acknowledging our concerns on certain issues. These publications could and should be used to help guide you through certain decision-making processes. If you can implement policies based on recommendations, I feel it is, is in the best interest of this audience to recommend this literature for review before casting any votes this evening. Thank you, Ms. Hinton. Next we have Laura Bond. Ms. Bond, I appreciate you taking time to come up this evening. Do we need, do you need me to go over the guidelines again or? Okay, thank you. But I did start with five down to three. Now 60 seconds is not gonna be great. Just so you know, I'm gonna give you what I got. Speed reading is also not how I would probably present this. Okay, I have been an educator in this district for nearly 20 years. And one of the things I'm hearing a lot about, seeing a lot, our concern about CRT or critical race theory. I want to clarify that's simply not something that is happening in our schools. It's a college level course. Um, it's not masquerading as anything else. Um, when I hear that someone even broaden that term to encompass SEL or social emotional learning, I really do feel a need to speak out and defend or clarify that misunderstanding. That's not something that we teach. It's a part of teaching. We have to understand the social and emotional needs of our students when they come every day. It impacts their learning. Um, cut, 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 cut. Uh, there are professionals, counselors, who have similar lessons about standing up against bullies and standing up for yourself, and I don't see why anyone would have a problem with that. If y'all want to make a big difference, pick up those pens and fill out a subbing application. That's what we need. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bond. Next, we have uh, Garrett Gabriel. Garrett, thank you for taking time to talk with us this evening. Do you need me to go over the guidelines yeah, again no, for this evening? Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so what I want to say isn't about masks. 
it's really about following policy because we have a lot of people in this room who want to take part in changing the policy, but apparently feel the need to not follow said policy. Um, if, if the speed limit is 70 miles an hour and I want to make it 90, does that mean that I drive 90 until it gets changed? And if I get pulled over by the police, do I explain to them that I don't follow the 90? So what I'm suggesting to the board is we send home all the parents and students with the rule books for the classrooms and we let them highlight rules that they want to follow so that we know which rules are actually going to apply to which people. Um, what you have to understand is this sets a bad precedence because your political opposites, if they can justify anything, can disregard any rule. So if you remove the books you want to remove, they can say, oh, sorry, freedom of speech, we're actually going to keep them anyway. So you need to understand that following the rules is important because that's how we play the game fair. And that's all I have time for, 60 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. Mr. Field, Chris Field, you asked to speak to us about teacher retention. Mr. Field, thank you for coming this evening. Do you need me to go over the guidelines or anything with you again? Okay, very good. Thank you. I was going to talk about teacher retention. Um, one minute is not near long enough to do what I'd like to say, so I'll email you a copy of what I was going to say. But, you know, there comes a time, I don't think people who've never been in a classroom even have a clue what's going on in the classroom. You have no clue what we're dealing with, what we're taking home with us. Um, I taught for 17 years, resigned last year. I'm not gonna get into that, but you need to understand, we love the kids, we love the challenge of being able to make a difference, but it's so disheartening to realize such a big portion of our community doesn't support us, putting signs up saying we're abusing children. Like, what are you gonna do when we're all gone? And like, who said that, Laura? Come sub, come see what it's like. Thank you, Mr. Field. Thank you again for taking time to come and visit with the board. We always encourage and value input from our community and the USD 305 patrons, and we appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us. The next item on our agenda will be the return to instruction with Ms. Exline. Ms. Reed, I'm sorry, I, yours got slipped under another one. If you could send your comments to us, that'd be great, okay? Thank you. Superintendent, excellent. Good evening. I, I'm here tonight because there have been some changes with the Saline County Health Department, and those changes warrant us making some adjustments to our return to instruction plan. And so I want to go through um, with you just a little bit of background. I want to remind you about what is in that plan, and then I would like to recommend to you a couple changes and open up for discussion and questions. So our goals haven't changed. The first goal is keep students and staff healthy and in school, teaching and learning despite exposures to COVID-19. The second is to ensure that our students have access to well-rounded educational opportunities. And I think that we've done a really good job of both of those. I do want to share with you um, just the Saline County context because I have shared this with you before. One of the metrics that is used by KDHE is the number of cases per 100,000. You can see that we had a peak the week of the 16th of January, and then it has declined since that time. 
Um, we are down to 727 cases per 100,000. For That was last week. 150 is considered in the red, but we are on the decline. The second um, metric is the percent positive. And you can see that same kind of trend there. We had an increase up through the week of the 16th, and now you're seeing a decline. Um, on that, 15% is considered red. And then our transmission level in Saline County remains high, and it, it's been high all along since I have started presenting this data, and, and since the, um, they have actually started releasing that metric. COVID cases in our schools, and I'm only reporting since the change in quarantine guidelines. Um, at that time, I told the school nurses, just send me the total number of positives that you have, staff and students combined, um, once a week, just so that we have a feel of what's happening in our schools. So the week of the 17th, we had 107 positives. The week of the 24th, we were down to 105. And then last week, we were down to 61. Um, so a, a nice downward trend there. So with that context, I just want to remind you what the Safe Return to Instruction plan is. If you will recall, the first seven points are the, there are seven categories out of the CDC guidance, and we are required to say what we are doing about them. We are not required to do any certain thing. We just are required to be transparent about how we're addressing each one. There is some co confusion that our, our um, following what is recommended is tied with funding. It is not. So I just want to be really transparent that the board has control over how we address these, and that's what we want to engage in a conversation about tonight. There is also a section of the um, return to instruction plan that talks about the continuity of services. And that is just for us to be making sure that we're attending to how are we going to make sure that students' academic needs, social, emotional, mental health needs, um, food stability needs, those kinds of needs are met so that they can have um, really solid learning when they're in our classrooms. So I, why am I asking you to talk about this tonight, and why am I recommending changes to you? Well, a lot has changed as we've kind of walked this path of COVID. And um, early on um, last year, a vaccine did become available for adults. That was positive. And so people had a choice. Whether they wanted to do vaccination or not, they had a choice, and so that was good. And then we had the vaccine that became available. It was approved for 12 to 17-year-olds. Again, more choice for people to make a personal decision. And then at that time, at the very beginning of this year, you'll recall that I reported to you that the Saline County Health Department had said that we, they were going to quarantine any student who was within three feet of a positive student in our schools. In the community at large, it was six feet, but in our schools, because of our protective measures, they were going to do within three feet. And that was consistent with the guidance. After we had been in school a little while and with some conversation with the Saline County Health Department, the determination was made that they would do no quarantine in a school environment if both parties were masked. And so there was a lot of conversation at that time about the implications of students and attendance and missing school as a result of quarantines. Okay, and so I remember some discussion about should we mask, should we not mask, and that weighing on some of your minds. Fast forward a little bit, and here recently the vaccine became available for 5 to 11-year-olds, another place where families can take um, personal choice and control of um, protecting their family in that way if they choose to do so, masking if they choose to do so, um, but another place where families have a decision. Most recently, since our last meeting, three things have happened. The first is that Saline County Health Department discontinued contact tracing. There were so many cases, and um, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment was stepping away from contact tracing and told Saline County Health that they could step away from contact tracing. And so the decision was made to do that. At the same time then, they discontinued quarantine orders. So there is still a recommendation 
that if you're exposed, that you would quarantine, but they stepped away from issuing orders, okay? So that really is a pretty significant shift that I wanna to talk to you about how that impacts our return to instruction plan. And then finally, the Saline County Health Department in, in compliance, in alignment with the governing body, the governing agency, if you will, for public health, which would be KDHE, they made the decision to go ahead and shorten the isolation to five days and then five days masking, okay? So some pretty significant changes, those last three things here in just the last few weeks. So I wanna draw your attention, this, in your board packet, there was, um, on letter E, it talks about contact tracing in combination with isolation and quarantine in collaboration with the state and local health departments, okay? And in the old wording, there were four points there and they all talked about um, how we were going to engage in um, contact tracing, Saline County Health would be notifying people of um, the need to quarantine. And with the change in what they're doing as far as contact tracing and quarantining, we can remove that language and edit it. So my recommendation to you at this time would be to acknowledge that the Saline County Health Department is the agency with the statutory authority to order quarantines and isolations, which has always been the case, but that we will not be contact tracing in our schools because they aren't quarantining, they're not contact tracing. So no contact tracing will occur in our schools. And the second thing is that USD 305 will comply with any quarantine isolation orders that they issue um, because we have to by law. <laughs> they are, they're the agency that issues those. Um, so if they would issue a quarantine isolation order, we would comply with that. Okay, so my recommendation would be to remove the wording um, related to the close contacts, all of that, and to leave this wording, okay? The second area is I. And in I, there used to be three points. The middle point was that USD 305 nursing staff will coordinate with Saline County Health Department when contact tracing is needed. Since there is no contact tracing, we can just remove that point, leaving the wording that you see on the screen, okay? Now, I want to bring to your attention one other area, and that is the area of masking. I did not redline this in the board packet because this is something that I think the board needs, needs to discuss. Um, one of the things that I heard early on when we were talking about masking in our schools was a real desire by the Board of Education to make sure that students were in school. And one of the things that I know weighed for several of you was that quarantine policy. And so I, what I want to say to you is the current, um, the current wearing of masks, we are requiring universal mask wearing in our schools. Um, and we are not requiring masking when students are engaged in vigorous physical activity. That's a recommendation um, from one of the national groups. Um, that we are not requiring masking outside on 305 property. We are not requiring proof of vaccination status, never have, and that we are posting information about masking and about our expectations um, at the entries of our buildings and around our buildings. So alternate wording that you, you could consider would be something like what I have on the screen. And I, what I, so what I want to do is just allow you to talk as a board about how you want to move forward with this. The alternate wording, um, if you wanted to make masking optional, um, you could do that during after school hours, you could do that all the time, you could leave masking universally required. Um, I would say that we would still not require verification of vaccination status. An exception to that would be if there becomes a law that we have to do that, then we'll come back and, and adjust that. Um, and then again, that we would continue to post information about correct masking and masking requirements, okay? The reason that I left this and I didn't redline it in here is those other two sections need to be changed because of the changes at the Saline County Health Department. This particular portion, I felt like that the board, um, if you wanted to, that some discussion was warranted, okay? 
So I want to go through one other thing. Um, possible motions, and then I'll just open up for questions. One motion, um, one possible motion would be to accept the changes as presented in the board packet, meaning accept the changes that would remove the contact tracing wording. Um, another option would be to move that the changes as presented in the packet and the changes presented this evening regarding masking be approved. And that motion could include any stipulations. For instance, um, if the downward trend continues or on such and such date or when, but I, I just wanted to give you an idea of kind of where the options really are at this point, and now I'm open for any questions that you have. Dr. Bender? I really appreciate your presentation, Lynn. You do a great job laying things out and the, the, the candor and the difficulty of this whole process. Since our last meeting, as you stated, there was a period where things hadn't changed, and then KDHE and Saline County Health Department made changes. I personally have fretted ever since that came out, because as everybody knows, and many people have written to me about this, I stated at the front end that the reason I supported masking was to keep students in school, because if they, if they weren't wearing masks, they were gonna go on quarantine. There was no other way around it. Well, that argument's no longer there. And I wanna be honest with everybody else and, and with myself in this, that I appreciate what you put on the red card is what it comes down to. We can talk all day about it. I don't wanna take everybody's time, but I feel like that's the right thing to do at this point in time in Salina. I wanna take a second too and acknowledge the hard work that teachers have done in this, whatever the vote winds up being. Ms. Bond, Mr. Field, others that have spoken and, and hoped to speak. This has been a hard year, a hard two years. And I just wanna take a second to recognize how hard it is to teach with a mask, how hard it is for the students to learn with a mask. It's hard, no doubt about it. But we had to do it because of the quarantine. I'm convinced of that. So that, that's my stance on this. But I, I personally, and I wanna hear what everybody else has to say for sure, but I first personally would like to go with what Lynn puts out A1 here. Thank you, Dr. Bander. Any other questions from board members? Ms. Schamberger. Well, thank you, Lynn, for your, all your work there, and thank you for all your uh, input uh, from the emails that we've gotten and from the teachers uh, who have cried out that they can't breathe, they're, they're, um, <clears throat> their students are struggling. So um, I did some, you know, uh, research like you said to do. <laughs> anyway, CNN uh, interview, they're saying uh, with the vaccines, which uh, is a large percentage, 65% uh, of Kansas are vaccinated uh, with one dose, 56% have been fully vaccinated. But uh, this um, interview with Lena Wan, who is the CNN's health pundit, she said three things, the vaccines, the one-way masks, and the natural immunity in place would be um, the responsibility for the mandates should be shifted from the government, state and local, to the family and the individual responsibility by the family to decide whether you want your child to be masked because there's so many things in place, plus the drop in the COVID cases. Um, Uh, on the news tonight, you know, countries are totally taking down the COVID restrictions. Tonight, uh, five or six states have dropped the state mandates for masking. So it is a nationwide thing that is coming. But um, I would just, in, I would agree with Mark that the masking should be optional and with everything else that's been in place with the vaccines the uh, one-way masking, which is protective if you want your child or your, is your teacher to, that will protect you and the natural immunity. And there's one thing that we haven't really talked about is that's prayer because we can pray because he's the one, God is the one that's in charge ultimately. So we can all to <laughs> agree with that one. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schamberger. Mr. Grant. The under E, um, superintendent, the next line. Um, we weren't leading contract tracing efforts prior to the change from Sling County Health, correct? 
That is correct. I'm watching for my light to go on okay, so I know good. when this will pick me up. You're good. Um, that is correct. We were never leading that. That was always directed by the county health department. And to be perfectly honest, all we were doing was providing a list to them of here are students that were that met this criteria and this criteria and this criteria, and then they were determining who had to um, quarantine and who didn't. So they've always had that statutory authority that has never um, been with the district. Looking at E specifically, I, I got the feeling from the way Saline County Health's wording was issued that it wasn't necessarily a we don't think this is necessary at this time, but we can't keep up with it at this time. Um, and so looking at looking at our wording and our plan, I would look to strike one, um, adding contract tracing to their authority under the leading sentence there, um, and stating in two that we would comply with uh, requests as we have historically for contact tracing. Okay, I want to make sure I have this. So your recommendation would be that we change the no contact tracing will occur in schools to contact tracing in schools will be the responsibility of the Saline County Health Department. Health Department. Is that okay yeah, wording? Same as the statutory authority for quarantines and isolations and that USD 305 will comply with quarantine and isolation orders issued by Saline County Health Department and requests for information related to contract tracing from Saline County Health Department. Okay. I think that would be, in, in practice, that would be kind of what we would expect of ourselves if, if we were moving through those hoops. I, I would guess if okay. they were reaching out for those, that information. Um, with absent contact tracing, are we notifying parents, students of any sort of classroom positives or anything like that? We are not. Okay. Um, right now, I, the assumption with as many cases as there are really should be you've been exposed. I mean, there are just that many cases. Uh, I had one other note, I'm sorry. I'm trying to scroll between pages here. Um, if, if we're agreeable to make that change to E, the redlined sentence in I, I think would probably still stand um, as fitting practice. Um, moving back to A uh, and looking at the clock, it's 6.30 p.m. We have staff that's reporting in the morning in less than six or less than 12 hours, students reporting in less than 13. Um, we gave, part of why I feel like why we scheduled a special meeting at the beginning of the school year was to give families a chance to plan and have that information in front of them ahead of time um, to make those decisions that they felt like they needed to that were necessary for their families. And so I would not be in favor of making masks optional um, upon vote by this board or tomorrow morning necessarily either. I think we owe it to, as, as we have worked over the past um, almost 23 months in navigating this change, we've tried to provide um, as clear of a long-term picture for our families and our students as we can. Um, that's not always been possible, but we've worked uh, to provide that long-term stability and that long-term plan for them. So as for our staff especially, that we gave them ample time to respond to changes in how we were operating at the beginning of the school year, I would not want to cut on them tomorrow morning and say these changes are coming down. So if, if, if again, this board is agreeable to making that change, um, I would see that happening uh, with a, a few days notice Monday, Friday, uh, whatever that date might be operationally that makes sense. Um, giving them time to, to make changes in, in what they're doing um, for their own health or their own comfort, I think we owe them that. Um, also through that process, um, I think we, we need some sort of um, 
m metric in, in regards to conversations with Saline County Health of if the standward trend does not continue, um, when, when masking on a, on a building by building case uh, may be necessary and warranted and help the, the situation of, again, going back to that long-term goal that we set out in July when we started this of keeping students in school. Um, if a, a reversal of this, I don't, I don't know that district as a whole would be the necessary change, but building by building or classroom by classroom, if that, if that would make sense in the future, some parameters for how that could happen. Mr. Grant, if I could just ask on that, um, I guess, are, are you visioning that as something that administration would work with the health department on building by building possibly? And Ms. Excellent, is that reasonable? I mean, if <laughs> they don't seem to be much help, I guess, uh, in that process. Um, but if we're getting information back from nurses and are seeing huge spikes at a particular attendance center, uh, it, would, it would make sense to me that we have some sort of process in place to put some mitigation in, in place to, to help slow that or limit keeping, again, with the end goal of keeping kids in school and in the classroom with the teacher. Are you looking for a metric number, or is that something, I guess, that we would expect administration to work through? I think administration to work through and to find those sorts of, uh, again, collaborations with community partners and Sling County Health specifically. Um, they, they have to be tracking something. I know KDHE is still tracking stuff, and they have to have some sort of outlook and, and thought process beyond all of that. So, As we're going down the line, I guess, Ms. Coso, would you? No. Ms. Zimmerman? Well, I'm not quite sure how I come down on this, except that I just have to think it through. Um, we... As far as nationwide mask mandates lifting, um, the ones that are recommended by science seem to be always saying we should not have to mask in highly vaccinated areas. And Salina and Saline County have never been a highly vaccinated area. Um, just in the past two weeks, I was just in response to some of the emails I've been getting I, there are um, studies or recommendations, uh, I guess they are recommendations, by Mayo Clinic and the CDC to continue masking. Um, we have had many emails on both sides and uh, some saying my young person can't, won't be able to attend school if, they, if there aren't masks apparently for some condition they have. Um, I'm concerned that the downward trend has been happening for about three weeks, maybe two weeks. Um, that does not make much of a trend in my uh, experience of the pandemic. Um, I would rather see us well, I would rather that we wait and that we watch for that downward trend. And if it really does keep going down, we'll get out of the high transmission rate, um, which we've never been out of since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and the fact that we're tired of masks, which I'm as tired of, any of them as anybody. I just spent um, hours in the classrooms in the last few weeks, and it's exhausting but there has been a reason for them. And if we, uh, we uh, it's true that children don't tend to get sick very often from COVID, at least not in a serious way, but we have more than children on our buildings. And if our, if our teachers get sick and our parents, then we can't have class because they need to be there. Um, so, Um, so I'm waiting to, I would like to wait to see, I know waiting is, we're tired of waiting, 
but I would like to see that spike come back down because it's been higher than it ever was in the whole pandemic just about three weeks ago. And I would like to see it if it stays down or keeps going down until our transmission rate is out of the red. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Mr. Gardner, do you have any comments you'd like to make or conversation? As most of you know, I'm not a big speaker. This has been an enlightening experience, and unlike some, the Bible says it's okay to be mad, but don't sin. Some of the actions and behaviors that we've witnessed during this pandemic have been nothing short of childish on some people's behalf. And so I'm ashamed for you. And so the objective that we sit here is to make sure that our staff and the kids are taken care of. And just because you don't get your way and you want to pout doesn't make you right. What we're looking at, and one of the things that nobody seems to be considering, is what is going on at Salina Regional Health Center. Okay? What I'm trying to get you to understand, what I'm trying to get you to understand, What I'm trying to get you to understand, it doesn't make sense for somebody who is actually ill to go to the hospital and have to sit in the emergency room for two or three days because they can't get into a room because of COVID patients. If you would please try to listen, okay? Everybody's real good on jumping up and down and shouting. And when you start shouting, I turn you off. I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to listen to you. You want to shout at somebody, go home and shout at your family. Don't shout at me. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is there's a lot that goes into the decision that we have to make. And we have to be concerned, and we have to look at the full gambit of what's going on in our community and how is one thing going to affect another. A lot of you wanted the masks to come off because other schools took them off and those schools went remote for a week or two, and then it came back. We've never had to go remote this year. You may not have liked it, but the big fight was when we went remote, you didn't like that because the kids didn't learn. And so we've got masks so the kids can come back to school. It works. You may not like it, but it works. What this has revealed is a, a different light on how we approach things as an organization. We have to stand firm on what we believe in individually and as a collective body. And so I may not agree with everything. Everybody sitting at this dais may not agree with everything. But we support one another. And we stand behind one another. And that's what we should be doing in this community. Even when something doesn't go our way. And a lot of times things don't go my way. But I have to understand that there's a greater good. And so I'm all for going to the point to where we can make masks optional. I have no problem with that. Even the doctor on CNN that we got information on, I watched it last night. And what she said was, yes, it's, it's time to go to optional. If your health system can support it, not every health system is at the same level. We're already struggling to have subs come into our schools. We're, we're already struggling to have teachers in our schools. We don't need to make that situation worse. So, as someone who has kids that are in this system working, I have grandkids that are in this system trying to learn. I have friends that are in this system trying to teach. Yes, I probably have a different perspective than most. And I'm not going to budge when it looks at the health and their well-being. Just can't do it. 
So can we get there? Yes. I'm like Ann. I'm not ready to make a harsh decision right now because I don't think we have the things in place that says, okay, if it goes and turns the other way, what do we do? If we can put a plan together, I'm all for coming back, having a special meeting, whatever it takes, but we need to have a plan. We just can't make a knee-jerk reaction. I remember one person jumped up and said, if you don't like it, move your kids. Well, that was really grown. So what we have to do is we have to work through this as adults. We have to talk with each other and communicate. And if we do that, I'm sure that we can meet a happy medium to where everybody is happy. So yes, I agree. It's time to look at going optional, but we've got to have a plan. And at this point, I have not seen that plan. So if we can get that plan together, I'm for voting for that. Mr. Gardner, just so I'm clear as we move forward, is that a plan? I guess, are you wanting that plan from administration? Are you wanting that plan from the health department? Where no, are I, you? I just want it from the administration. From the administration? Okay. Ms. Exline, is that anything you'd be prepared to speak to or adjust? I know that's... We, I, it would be easy to set a metric per building if they get to a certain number of positives, a certain percent of the student body positive that we would then um, mask for a two-week period like some other districts are doing. Other districts have um, done th anywhere from 3% of the students positive to 6% of the students positive. Um, I'm trying to think right now through our buildings over the last week. Um, I had one elementary school that had eight. I think that that was the high in an elementary school of about 400 students. I, I don't know what their exact enrollment would be, but we could look at one, at a number like that and then at that point go back into masks for a two-week period and if that number went down, then remove the masks again if that is something that the board feels comfortable with as a plan to, to just be responsive at an individual building level. And those numbers would be pretty easy to get. It would be um, a combination of staff and students. Keep in mind, a lot of what is being reported to us right now is self-report. Um, much of what we're getting is not coming through the health department. It's coming as a result of home tests. But we could certainly do that. Mr. Gardner, I, I think one of the challenges, I think, as we work through that is developing a plan that allows administration to respond. Would you be open to that? I, I would I would be a little hesitant to make something that was so rigid that it brought the seven of us back together to make a change if a change needed to be made. No, as long as we got a plan. Okay. Just give me a plan. Okay. So that you hear me, as long as we have a plan, something that we can get to the parents so that they know if this is ha if this happens, this is what we're going to do. All I want you to have is the plan so that you know exactly what the game plan is. We did not play, I, didn't, I never played football without having a game plan that we worked on the entire week before we played. When this happens, we know exactly what we're going to do. If this happens, we know exactly what we're going to do. The parents, the teachers, you all need to know what the game plan is. If we can put a game plan together, the quicker we get that done, I'm fine with that. But I think you need a game plan. We can't just go off the top of our heads or this is what looks good or somebody's doing this over in California really don't care we need a game plan Dr. Bandry Gabe posed earlier which I very much appreciate that in fairness to all parties we need if we approved option A as presented here we would need to have a a date if we had a date and asked the administration to work on the plan as we just described, would the two of those, I guess, kind of meet in the middle? And is that, is that, is that something feasible? If, if I could real quick, I think what I'm hearing you say, Dr. Bandre and, and maybe Mr. Gardner, is 
at the end of the day, maybe the task is we have asked administration to define that plan. I don't know, or, or are we wanting to, to approve that plan? Um, and I guess as I'm trying to understand the things that might eventually form into a motion here, um, would you, Mr. Gardner, be comfortable if part of a motion was to ask administration to have a plan ready by Monday to present, or are you saying that you would want us seven to approve that plan as well? You need the plan. Okay. Okay. I, I feel like a little bit that, that it needs to happen in conjunction with Sling County Health because as we talk about in, in E, we're not medical professionals. Um, this organization is not a medical organization and, and it feels like a little bit that we're just throwing it all out because, again, they said they can't handle it, not that it's not um, Im important work to be doing. They were not able to keep their heads above water doing it. Um, and so I, th I think some information from them on what meaningful data they could provide, what meaningful information they could provide, um, it would, it would suck as a community if it just got down to self-reporting positive cases to a school nurse and that was um, what the safety of our students and staff hinged on. Um, I, don't, I don't think we want to be at that point. Okay. Uh, it does, I mean, the reason they quit contract tracing is because there were too many cases to keep up with. So it isn't like we should say there's no more contact tracing, so there's no more danger. There's no more contract tracing because there were too many cases. Um, and the other thing I'm thinking about is that when Omicron hit, we thought we were sort of out of the woods or going down from Delta, and then we weren't. And uh, and it seems like there ought to be more than a couple weeks of downward trend before we decide we are really safer than we were. Now, there are people that want to throw out the masking because they never liked it in the first place, but we felt we had ample reason, including scientific support for the masks. Um, and I think we still do. Um, and so, I uh, would like, I would like a another week or two of downward trend before I support masking, and I'm not trying to play to the crowd here, I'm just trying to think things through, so um, a little more, a little more cushion, since the main peak of the whole pandemic would be a little better for me. Ms. Schamberger. Um, <clears throat> Mrs. Exline, you said that there were 61 cases last week. Was that of the, the whole 9,000 students and staff? <clears throat> that was at our, at our attendance centers only, K-12 okay. only, so that would be fewer than 9,000 so, <laughs> HR. So it is including something. students and staff. Right, it is are. including okay. students and staff that okay. are school based in our K-12 buildings. Okay, okay. So that the percentage is pretty small. Yeah, 6,800 kids and then the staff yeah, that would be. Right, right. Um, right. And I'm thinking, you know, I hear what Ann is saying and all of that. Um, <clears throat> well, we haven't really, none of us have mentioned the children and what they're going through, and I've, the um, breathing in their own CO2, because I've talked to some nurses, and there's a CO2 overload um, that's caused by continually masking. It causes anxiety, decreased ability to, to reason, uh, the decreased mental function, and this, I believe they've been masked for two years, right? Basically, anyway, uh, CO2 overload affects young children as well as older adults. It's detrimental of those who have asthma, allergies, bronchitis, and use medication. So, and um, there's also from the letters that I got 
from the teachers and from parents is that um, masking impairs the verbal and the nonverbal communication and they have not been able to see a face uh, or a smile. That the visual visualization of the entire face is a crucial importance to social, emotional, and speech development. And it, it was really detrimental to students with a, uh, English as a second language or uh, with the disabled. So I'm thinking we need to start thinking of the children. And plus, we're not saying do away with all the masks. It's just an optional mask. If the parents want to mask their children, that's, they're free to do that. It's an optional thing. So, um, and, and the mask, you know, according to a lot of people, the mask work, you know, and the vaccines are working. And so um, I would just encourage us to think about the children and those that haven't seen a face those first graders who haven't seen a face for two years. And um, you know that there's always that line, children need to be seen and not heard. And our children have been, they're not seen or heard. And um, it's just time that they can be seen and they can be heard and the socially, emotionally can um, go back to normal, whatever that is, but they can see a face. And if they wanna be masked, that's an option. You know, it's a, you know, it's a free choice. Thank you, Ms. Sir, any other conversation? Give me a I feel like we, we need to have some kind of emotion just because of the changes the Saline County Health Department has made for sure. I mean, the, the plan to, the return to instruction plan needs to be modified without a doubt. And again, I personally feel like within the window of what Lynn put on the, the red slide here, we need to be working towards the, the making mass optional, but I also agree that we need to have a plan. We can't just haphazardly do things. It's not fair to all members of the community at this point, especially teachers. But I'm not sure how to, how to phrase that. So I think we need to have discussion in, in that direction. I, you know, like Mr. Grant said earlier, I don't, I don't know if four days or a week is reasonable to come up with a plan that way. I don't know if, I don't, I don't know how much time is needed to be, have a proper process there. Mr. Gardner. Mm -hmm. Mr. Grant. Uh, Mr. Gardner, when you say you want to see a plan, um, was that for approval by this body or just that you want a plan to be in place? I would make a motion. Um, I'm going to converse about this before I state that I'm making a motion, if that's okay, Ms. Howard. Um, I would make a, I would be prepared to make a motion with the, the changes I recommended to E and I. Um, I'm, I'm not sure on the wording of A. Um, Maybe two motions. Can we do that in two motions? Okay, so I would make a motion, Mr. President, um, that we approve uh, the changes as amended this evening um, to section E and section I of the return to instruction plan. Mr. Gardner seconds. We have a motion and a second in discussion on that motion. So, uh, are you talking about uh, changing that well, number one on? Removing the I. red line from I on number two. Um, and on uh, section E, adding contract tracing into the statutory authority of Saline County Health Department as stated in the leading sentence. Um, and then what was number four, uh, adding in our cooperation in contact tracing as requested by Saline County Health Department. Okay, I think I understand. <laughs> Ms. Howard, is that, do you have everything correct there? 
We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign. That motion carries 7-0. Is there a second motion being prepared? Kind of. Um, I'm trying to form the, the thought process in my head here. Um, as we as we put that together, I, th I guess the thought I have in mind is we do have other districts that have modeled similar things that I think could be used as a template and plugged in pretty quick. I would also, as I shared earlier, not want something that was so restricted that we had to come back and approve a plan. I, th I, think, I think, think leaving it up to administration. Yeah, on, I think administration has to be agile. Yeah, figuring that to out. To respond as needed. I, th I think to Scott's comment and my, my concern earlier for the, the understanding and the forward planning of staff and students that um, that plan be together, be able to re be released to families and staff, um, but with a three school day buffer on implementation um, just so that they have it in hand uh, and can reflect on what that means for their household before needing to report to a building either for work or school uh, under that assumption if that makes sense okay so how do you say that in a motion now <laughs> i'm sure miss howard got it down i, ha uh, <laughs> I have a thought but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would move uh, District, district administration uh, have the purview to adjust uh, Section A of the District re Safe Return to In-Person Instruction and Continuity Service Plan um, with any further changes to that paragraph um, in structure being delivered to uh, made available widely three school days prior to its implementation. Uh, that's on the release of the plan, not being agile on the back end of responding to concerns if a building needed to mask or move out of an unmasked uh, situation based on the, the data of that plan. So if I understand your motion correctly, Mr. Grant, Administration would be able to put together their plan, make an announcement, and three days later that change would take effect. Correct. Of of the structure of the the overlying plan, future action based on those metrics of what needs to happen uh, could be made on a next school day basis if masks needed to be required or we're moving out of that based on the metrics. If that does that Okay, so I just want to make sure that I'm understanding. So what you're wanting is that we would move to masking being optional, that the administration would set criteria for moving back to masking if we need to based upon COVID cases in an individual school, and that we would give three days notice of the change to move to masking optional to families. Correct. Okay, and what, I, what I'm thinking just conceptually is that if I would use data on a Thursday, have nurses report to me on a Thursday. I'm not necessarily saying, again, in the, the implementation of it, just in this initial step of masking will be optional on a future date. Okay. District administration has gone through the work, uh, reviewing plans from other districts in conjunction with Saline County Health. Here is our plan in its form. Uh, it says if a school is higher than this metric of COVID cases, of percent positive for the community, whatever that statistic may be, masking will be required in that attendance center. This plan goes into effect three, bit, three school days um, from today with masking optional or if, I guess if that attendance center f still falls and qualifies under the, whatever parameters are set through that plan, okay. masking would still be required there. I understand what you're wanting. Is there anything we're missing, Superintendent Excellent? I wanna ask a question. Um, it seems like at some point we talked about some challenge when not all the schools are the same, um, but is there something uh, that we're missing on that? I mean, I mean, that's the first thing I have, but do you have any thoughts on that, Ms. Exline? 
I do. I mean, I, I think that once masks are off, it's going to be very difficult to remask. Um, but I think if there is a, a window, I think that, uh, you know what, our kids have been great and our staff, I can't say enough about our staff, um, and their willingness to do what they need to do to meet students' needs. So I, I think we can make it work. I think that it, um, it won't be without challenge, but you know what, what our teachers do every single day is a challenge. And I mean, <laughs> several of them spoke to that tonight. So I, I, I don't wanna say that this is easy. <laughs> um, I do know that I did initially, and I didn't ask administrators about this again. You know, I asked several months ago that there was some hesitation for the mask, unmask, mask, unmask. Um, my hope would be as the numbers decline, we won't be in that back and forth um, situation. It, but I, I do think that we can set some metrics and meet what Gabe is suggesting. And, um, and, and then if things aren't working, I'll bring it back to you. Ms. Kessler? So masking was just one of our lines of defense. Will the other lines of defense, which is hand washing, distancing, still be a part of our school day? Right, so the hand washing is still a regular part of the school day. Um, we have um, signage up about hand washing as well, cover your sneeze. Um, we are talking to students about that. And um, we are distancing where possible, but I will tell you, and I think the teachers in this room would tell you, that it is, it is difficult to distance and have high quality instruction. And so um, because of cooperative learning kinds of things and because of class sizes and just the nature of what we do in elementary small groups, that kind of thing. But where we can, we are distancing and our teachers are doing a really good job of that. Not perfect. Pretty perfect. Ms. Zimmerman? I know it. When point, I, lunch has always been the challenge where there weren't any masks anyway. And I know we had at least one school that had big trouble at lunch and they spread them out more. Did that help? Well, what we had, we were seeing a high number of quarantines at our two middle schools, I think is what you're thinking about. And at that time, the, we worked with administration on how can we make sure that students aren't ending up quarantining because that was a time of day when they were unmasked. And with the guidelines that were happening with Saline County Health Department at that time, those students, when they were unmasked, were ending up in quarantine. And so we ended up setting up tables each day for lunch. Our MNO staff was fabulous, tearing those down so that students could be spread out more so that they weren't as close to um, as many students during that time when they were unmasked. So we have tried to be really flexible, and as issues have come up, um, work with staff to solve those, and staff's been very open to trying to figure out ways that we can keep kids in school, which was what we felt like your directive was. Thank you. Sweet. I think that Mrs. Wright has something. I don't know if this is something you all want or need, but I have been sitting over here typing out language for a motion based on your discussion. <laughs> if you decide to get to that point, I just want to let you know I have su some suggested wording that I'm sure could be massaged for your needs. Thank you. I think we kind of started down the path of a motion. Mr. Grant, is that correct? Do you want a I moment to confirm? Do you have a superintendent X line that you could put back up in its original form? I, if I pull up the board packet, I do. Hold on. 35. 35. Is it on the, um, is it posted to the website? While you're doing that, may I ask? Um, we're still having drastic substitute problems. Is that related to the virus, or and will this make that any worse, or do we just, I mean, teachers don't stay, well, I don't know. Um, do you have any comment on that, Ms. Wright or Ms. Eckline? Um, I, I have a couple comments on that. One is over the course of the entire pandemic, we have lost a significant number of our sub pool 
directly due to the pandemic. Um, many of them reported to us that they were in a class, uh, a group of um, people that were highly susceptible related to the pandemic due to age or health conditions or um, that type of thing. And, and the pandemic was a directly stated reason for not wanting to substitute. I will say more recently, we are sort of experiencing the same trend that's being experienced nationally by most employers, um, which is there's a, a great sort of shuffle right now related to employment. A lot of things are changing, work conditions, types of jobs. People are um, shuffling around and moving around right now and temporary positions or part-time positions um, don't seem to be at the top of the threshold right now for employment. There are new opportunities out there. There's new income associated with those opportunities out there, and people seem to be trying those out. So it's sort of a combination of those things. Okay, Mr. Grant, the board packet is... Is this what you wanted? Yes, now. thank you. Okay. I would make a motion um, looking at part one, section A, um, changing number one uh, to masking is optional in USD 305 facilities for all individuals. I guess, I mean, I guess the rest of the sentence can stand. Um, unless deemed um, as a necessary mitigation as part of the district's masking plan. Um, and then I would also direct administration to create a masking plan um, for during the school day um, in conjunction with Saline County Health and other community partners, um, laying out metrics for the necessary use of mass as a mitigation method in district attendance centers. And the whole motion would apply three school days after it was released in full to the families and community. Good job, Mr. Grant. <laughs> Ms. Wright, I know you were I acted like I was speaking slow, so Superintendent Exline could write. I was speaking slow so I could think could, through it. So you could think, head, very so. good. Is there any additional value of, from the conversation that we missed, Ms. Wright, that you maybe had in some of your draft? No, I think that covers it. I will say that I think the motion should clearly state, though, that the board is making a determination to make masking optional in addition to the plan. Just make sure, I think you stated that, but just to make sure that that's, in, those two things are specific. In changing number one, redlining required and writing in optional. One clarification. Are we striking two and three? Um, I, we need two. I just want to yeah. get a verbal that yes. Yes, okay. thank you. Aren't two and three, I mean, I guess you don't need them, but they don't change anything because masking is not required then. I mean, yeah. I just I, think for simplicity, I'd like to get them out of there if that's okay with the board. Okay. So we have a motion. Is there a second? Dr. Bandre seconds. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in. Uh, well, I'm going to discuss a little bit more. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I I'm concerned that that we don't really know that our falling rates are going to keep falling and. That's why I would probably put this at a farther in the future date than 
I mean, this year doesn't have a date at all, but uh, I think it would be better if it. I would say in practicality of the administration finding that plan, there's a, there's a chance that in conversations with Saline County Health Department and what they find from other districts that no building would meet the requirement for masking being optional. Um, I, th I think if that, if they come back and say that the most easily tracked data we could find was community wide, was whatever that number is, um, that it, it might be released, but three, three calendar or three school days from that point when the plan is released, one building might qualify for optional masking, no buildings might qualify for optional masking. Uh, they, might, they may get through that plan and decide that building by building is not feasible based on the data that's available um, and that it needs to be a district-wide decision as a whole. And I, again, would feel comfortable leaving that decision-making um, up to district staff. I think we would have an opportunity to, to see that plan uh, if it's released in the next month before our March board meeting where we could affirm its... Uh, its use and, and what's happening with it. But um, I would, again, I would say I'm not suggesting that something gets sent in the mail tomorrow and Monday morning everyone's unmasked because the, I, I just don't know what that, what they will find with metrics that they're digging through and what's available. Ms. Kessel. The other school districts that are doing this in case a school gets high numbers, are they looking at the transmitted, you know, we are in high right now. Are they looking at the school or the city or the county? I have not seen any district that is looking at the county. What I've seen, um, the plans that I've reviewed, the districts are looking at the individual building data and they're looking at one of two things. They're looking either at the number, the percent of students that are currently positive, or they're looking at the absences that are COVID related. So, and so in some districts, that means the uh, combination of isolations for students who are positive, students and staff who are positive, and quarantines, because there are some communities that are still do it, issuing quarantines. So there's that, and then there's the just positive numbers. In our community, it's going to have to just be, if we're going to look building by building, it would need to be positives. I have been reviewing attendance data overall, and another thing that we could do is attendance data in comparison to our normal average daily attendance. Uh, for instance, in a normal year pre-COVID, um, average daily attendance was 94.3%, I think is the number. It, it, I'm 99% right, that, that I'm 99% sure that's right, 94.3%. So if we, last week, our average daily attendance district-wide was like an 89 point something. So, and then I have that by every single building. So I could just look at how far are we off of the regular average daily attendance rate, knowing that in a normal year, we would have all the other sickness that we usually have, and that differential probably, much of it probably could be attributed to COVID. Maybe not all, um, but we could look at a metric like that. Um, I've not seen other districts do that. What I've seen them do is percent positive, percent positive and quarantined, which essentially is but that was attendance good, in a different way. That was getting good information back from a county health department, probably in that situation for both of those numbers. Right. Right. But, and I, so I'm just thinking, as, I, as I'm thinking about it, there are several options that we could use that I think would get us to the result um, that we need. And maybe it's a combination of those two. You know, we're collecting some of that data already anyway. Um, our tech department is reporting to me every week by building uh, to average daily attendance and, and actually by day, I get that. So there's, there's a combination of things I think we could use. I want to ask, do you, Ms. Eggsline, do you think, I mean, are we putting, we're sort of saying, oh, figure it out. Uh, are you guys 
happy to rise to that occasion, or uh, is that going to be a problem? We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure it out. And I, th I, I think that we can, um, we'll figure out something that is, a l that is flexible enough um, that allows us to notify families in a reasonable amount of time so that they know um, what is happening week to week, and we can, we can do that. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Does that, Scott, for you, does that clear up the things that you had concerns about? Okay. I would ask for a vote. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. The next item on our agenda this evening is the Summer Food Service Meal Program Retention Incentive with Ms. Peters. Yes, thank you. Moving on to some regular business here. Um, so the COVID pandemic, we just talked about how it's resulted in um, staffing issues for us. And one of the programs that have been affected by that is our Summer Food Service Programming. At the beginning of Mr. The President. Is there any way we could hold Mrs. Peters off until people are done talking? Yeah. Thanks. If we could, please, in the gallery, so we can move on with our meeting. Ms. Peters? In our summer food service program, um, we are seeing staffing difficulties um, to um, staff those programs, but also with the daily attendance um, in those programs. And so what we would like to do, if you remember that we have a retention incentive that we approved back in July um, for a regular staff, and then in November, no, I think it was December, you approved a plan for substitute um, teachers for a retention incentive, and now we'd like to add another layer for the summer food service program employees. Um, they're such a valuable resource to us, and that program serves our community throughout the summer. The plan is in your packet, and um, basically the parameters um, are laid out, um, and it's structured in a way to encourage staff to, one, um, agree to work in the program for the summer, also encouraging um, daily attendance, um, because there's a structure that um, if they work 75% or more of the program days, they would receive $500 retention incentive. 50% um, to 75 would receive $350. 25% to 50% of the program days would receive $250, and staff working less than 25% of the program days would receive $100. Um, estimated cost is about $15,000, and we would pay for this out of federal ESSER $3 and for the summers of 2022, 23, and 24. Are there any questions of Ms. Peters? Dr. Bendrick? This is slightly off topic. I've lost track of the, basically the government paying for lunches for the regular school year. And I, I fully support what's described here. I think it's a great use of the ESSER funds as well, especially being able to take it out three summers that way. But I, while we're talking about lunches, I just can't remember when people have to start paying again from the government's perspective. Well, the summer program is always free meals for ages um, 1 to 18, and that will continue to be that way in the summer. We haven't heard the news um, for what's going to happen in the next school year. I don't think the federal government has decided and USDA if it's going to be free again or not. I think they have some budget um, decisions to make. Any other questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion. So I would move that we approve the addition of the Summer Food Service Meal Program Retention Incentive as presented. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Zimmerman, seconds. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. The next item on our agenda is with Mr. Upson, the Durham School Service Retention Incentive. Similar to uh, what Ms. Peters talked about, similar but a little bit different. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in 
also significant staffing difficulties for Durham, Durham School Services. And Durham provides our general education, special education, activity, field trip, and shuttling service to USD 305 nearly every day of the week. Um, at the beginning of the school year, the board approved the retention incentive plan to help the district prevent an increase of open positions, and we would like to add Durham school services to that plan for similar purposes and because the services they provide are essential to the mission of USD 305. Um, much, much like most of USD 305 and Salina, frankly, Durham is struggling to maintain adequate staffing levels to provide the services that we're contracted with them for, and that's been since the onset of the pandemic. We therefore propose that we add this program into the retention incentive plan. Durham plans, to, what, what's a little different is, is we're, I don't want to micromanage Durham, so we don't have a whole lot of detail of, of how they want to use it because I want to make sure that their general manager has the flexibility to use that retention incentive to best incentivize his employees because I don't know how to incentivize bus drivers. So to that end, um, they plan loosely to incentivize and provide monthly employee incentives for daily attendance and retention through the summer months, um, much, much like food service and our paraeducators. There's an attrition that happens over the summer, um, which is problematic. In addition, we have normal attendance day to day that Durham is dealing with, and that's really not good. Um, when you've got bus routes that you have to cover for, it's pretty complicated and uh, challenging, and they can't fail at it. So it causes some issues that we're trying to help them solve. Um, the cost of the retention incentive is $50,000, and that would be funded from federal ESSER three allocations and would apply to summer of 2022 and, and 2023. So that's a total of $100,000 spread over two years. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Dr. Bender. So I, I want to kind of shine Durham's halo a little bit. Back when the windstorm happened and the building blew out all the windows on the buses, how, how were they able to fix that so quickly? That, I think that's a, something we need to talk about that helps make this a reasonable, very reasonable proposal. Their, their general manager drove to the surrounding states to get glass to fix them. We couldn't fix them in a day or two days, but he was able to make that happen. I think it was 26 pieces of glass that ended up needing to be repaired. To, be, to be clear, this is, this is not for glass. Um, <laughs> I, I would also like to note that there's a, there, that should the board approve this, there's a draft agreement, there's a, actually the, the final agreement's been reviewed by Council on both sides in in your packet and one of the things we wanted to make sure is that that this incentive did not get scooped up into the Durham coffers at the national level never to be seen from again and so we much like we did when we when you agreed to pay them when we were re all remote um, we wanted to make sure that we had some a, a, an agreement with some teeth that made sure that 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 money went straight to the Salina office to be used with, with the employees that serve us directly. Ms. Zimmerman? I move that we uh, add Durham, uh, we've approved the addition of Durham School Services retention incentive as presented. We have a motion, Ms. Caso seconds. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Mr. Epson. The next item is with Ms. Rector, Summer School. Good evening. Okay, I'm here tonight to talk about, to review our 2021 summer school program and also bring you a proposal for 2022. 
I want to start with some general highlights. First, I actually have to give a special thanks to Tricia McVeigh and Krista DeVoe and Tiffany Lowe, who are in the audience tonight. Uh, Tricia was our elementary director, and Krista was our secondary director, and then Tiffany is our director of student support services. It was through their hard work and planning and, and diligence and working with staff to make a successful summer school program that served many, many kids across the community. So I just wanted to, to say thank you to them and really say thank you to all of the departments that came together to make summer school happen. Because this year, last summer, was a, a new year for us. We tried new things and we were able to pull together and to have a very successful program throughout the summer the longest summer school that we have ever had. So first, we had two successful summer school sessions. We had one that went from June 15th to July 2nd, and then we started again on July 7th and went through July 23rd. And so of those two sessions, basically we repeated summer school twice. And so we were able to capture what we didn't get to do in 2020 and put it all into the summer of, of 2021. And so we actually served approximately 1,000 students. And so our student number did go up. And to the number that we served, we had over 125 staff providing services. So if you think about the school year that our teachers had in 2021 for us to have office staff and custodial staff and you know, basically MIS staff and teachers and administrators, everybody coming together to be able to provide those services was astounding. Everybody was tired and they just kind of kept on going through that summer. We had um, South High School was a new site for us and it had been at Central High School for many years and so really we're gonna try to start rotating that summer school experience between Central and South and so have it at South for the next few years. And then also we had two elementary locations going at the same time. So we had Cottonwood and Huesner were our two elementary buildings and so that allowed us to have some flexibility and to keep kind of the population small and spread out at those um, two elementary buildings. We were able to provide bus routes and you know, speak of Durham and all of the hard work that they did. They're very creative to be able to get our students to school in the summertime with a, with a unique schedule, but we also added our high school students to the busing this year, especially with it at South High School that did put more constraints on some of our families. So we wanted to make sure that we met that need and provided busing at elementary, middle school, and high school. And then when we talk about food resource, our summer lunch program went all through the summer and so they were able to provide lunches for both sessions and then also some other times during the summer. And then we had the food bank partnered with us. And for some of our families that were having food um, shortages at their homes over the weekend, we actually had some bags that went home with students to provide um, food for them. So really an exceptional summer and for us to be able to come together and to make that happen, we were really proud of those actions. So. Yes, thank you. And so just to give you a little bit of highlights on elementary, we were able to serve over 500 students and that was up of about 100 students. So it, we were able to serve more over those two things, over those two sessions. And then you look at the number of kindergarten classrooms and, and first grade classrooms, really we doubled the number of classrooms we were able to serve too. This year we really targeted making sure that the class sizes were small, that we were able to spread out, and we had all of those kind of things in place, those mitigation strategies that were so important during the school year. Some celebrations to look at from this perspective is that you know, prior to summer school, we really utilized our staff to, to think, um, to give input and to be very flexible in the, in the way that we were providing summer school. We kind of divided how we did math and reading differently than before. We, we um, put in more with the social emotional supports of our students and, and really tried to, to enrich what was happening within our summer schools program. With this increased enrichment, we had community partners come and stand side by side and weekly things from Big Brothers and Big Sisters. We had the Salina Public Library reach out to our elementary and really looking at that enrichment aspect to summer school and having those things take place. Oftentimes you hear about summer slide and that's when students maybe when they leave in, the, you know, in May and come back in August in the fall that we might not see them performing at the level that we'd want but 
92% of our students that were involved with summer school actually maintained their re reading level over the school over the summer and into that next fall. So really looking at those inputs that the teachers put in there. You know, we don't have the exact same kind of data for math because math was very much personalized to the type of instruction that they were getting because of such um, diversity in, in the needs of math. But really exciting things happening with our summer school at elementary. If we think about the middle school, with middle school we had 128 students participate. Um, actually, let me go back a slide and kind of point something out. You see the 511, act, that was the total number of unique students that we were able to serve. Some of those students went to both sessions, reading and math, and some of those students only went to math and, or reading. And so that's why there's a difference in number between the 406, the 337. But of those numbers, 511 were unique students or individualized students. We served 128 middle school students. That was actually pretty much over double what we had served in years past. And so really excited about that. Again, we focused on having two different sessions, a reading session, a math session. And as you can see, that depending upon what grade level, we had different numbering of students take advantage of math or take advantage of reading. And some of those students took advantage of both sessions and attended in June and July. Celebrations with the middle school program, they were able to continue some of that project-based learning that we had been incorporating over the last few years, that social-emotional instruction, you know, going through and looking at lessons. You know, when we talk about PBL, that's basically infusing the community to look at kind of those, those projects that allow students to see the learning take place in a bigger in a bigger scope. And so we had Be Amazing, we had a garden party aspect to it where they were measuring um, all of the garden beds and, and determining how many flowers could go in there. They had the beehives. They did some real world ratios where they were doing things with the, looking at how to utilize ratios in their daily lives. I think they maybe even did some cooking or some, some you know, nutrition there. So we had these exciting programs and we were able to serve more students than we had in the past. High school is, um, is unique in the sense that with the high school program, it really is about the credits. It's about making sure that we have opportunities for students to, to make up credits that maybe they didn't pass a class um, during that, that school year be, uh, ahead or behind them or maybe even two years behind them because when you think about it, we didn't have summer school in 2020. And so there were credits to be earned, some recovery credits. And so when you see that 332 total half credits earned, what that means is, is that that was 332 um, semester classes that were earned. Every semester a student earns a half credit. And so that was 332 semesters of work that was earned over the summer. And so in June, we had about 218. In July, we had 114. And so you kind of see that we did have, you know, more um, students involved in, in the June program. Then enrichment, and that actual, that number was up about 150 for our credit recovery. Enrichment only had 27 students, or 27 credits earned for that. That is down compared to previous years, but I think some of that is because of the opportunities that we had with driver's ed, and then also some of the credit recovery opportunities. So we didn't see as many uh, students take advantage of the speech, the computer apps um, classes. These are classes that they choose to take. So to try to uh, fit these required credits in, so that way it gives more flexibility during the school year to, to be involved in um, career and technical education courses or into a, a course like we had music and art here earlier, the theater, to be able to fit more of that into their school year. Some students elect to take speech, computer apps one or computer apps two during the summer. Driver's education, we had 134 students participate. That was an increase of over 50 students. And our driver's education instructors, they were very flexible this summer to try to increase the number of students being able to participate. When you think about the fact that, you know, that is something that it, we are very proud to be able to provide that here in, in our district. And we know that many families need that and it helps them in many ways with insurance, but also with making sure that we have good drivers on the road. And so we were able to increase those numbers there. 
And then the ACT prep, we had 72 pr students participate. This is a shorter part of our summer school program, and really it's intensive, kind of a couple weeks work to be able to prepare for that, that June ACT. And so in the past, we've always kind of been around 70 students, so that kind of held steady. And when you think about that, that makes sense because these are the students that are usually taking it for the first time, and the students in 2020, you know, they would have already taken the ACT. So really this was the students that were wanting to, to take it here for the first time in 2021. So within our high school program, you know, we were really excited to be able to increase those numbers. So when we think about summer school, we get to, you know, it's February, but we get to start planning for the programs that we have. And so as we think about summer school this year, you know, there were lessons learned. We have some excitement of being able to have those two sessions and those two sessions in, in 2021 really were to kind of help us catch up with what we weren't able to do in 2020. Um, having two sessions uh, has its, you know, it's its positives and, and it has some challenges that it gave us as well. One of the things that our directors did as they worked with teachers and different departments is they, they did a survey and they, they really did find out that that July, teaching summer school in July all the way up until basically the kids walk back in in August, that's, that's tough. And what we found is that it really, we need to honor our teachers and so forth to make sure that we give them some rejuvenation. We have building operators, our busing system, our food service, you know, our infrastructure of technology. We have lots of things that we have to turn around in a very short time frame. And so, you know, in the summer of 21, we turned that around in an incredibly short time frame. But as we look at this summer, we really are going to go back to, or we, we make the recommendation to go back to having that one window. So that way we get that done before the July 4th holiday. It allows families to do what they need to do. And the summer of July allows our teachers and our hardworking staff that work year round to, to also have that time to get everything prepared for students in August. So what we're going to look at for this year, and, and the whole um, proposal for uh, the summer school is in, in the board packet in its entirety. Would I say an elementary program to be determined? What we're going to be looking at is the number of students. We're still going to try to meet the same number of students that we had last year. We're still going to continue to be flexible and look at either a student can be part of reading, a student can be part of math, or a student can be part of both. We want to do that for at both the elementary and also at the middle school level. So we are going to continue to have that flexibility and that choice and that need driving what students are involved in in the summer. So really on the elementary program, we anticipate having two buildings and we just need to see where our number's at, how many students do we have before we make that final determination of which elementary buildings. We will continue to have um, secondary at South High School. And the reason for that is because, you know, once you learn a building, you want to be able to live at that building for just a little bit. And so we really do want to give all of those, that, that secondary director and the secondary um, middle school and high school, summer school teachers the opportunity to teach again in that facility. And, and they've also were able to really work out some nice spacing with the middle school program separate from the high school program. When you look at the times, our times um, for elementary are eight to one. Middle school, 8 to 11, it's a little bit shorter. And then high school, right now what we have up there is the two sessions, 8 to 11 or 11.30 to 2.30. One of the reasons that you see the, the secondary programs end at 11 is so that way we can provide summer lunch for them. And then if they want to stay for that second session in the afternoon in the high school, we can do that. Um, with the elementary, we feed them kind of starting probably between 11 and 12.30 or so forth so we can have lunch and then come back to class before they end the day. And so that is another piece that we wanna look at. And then the other piece that's in your packet that I, that I actually did not have here in the, the proposal is that we are looking at a pre-K summer school as well, but lots of details need to be worked out of that because this will be a new adventure for us. And so we will, be, you know, so we will have some component of pre-K for our 305 schools. And, but that has lots of um, details to be worked out. But we will try to follow this um, window and then also the time so that makes it convenient for our families. Our elementary school enrollment fees at elementary, or excuse me, at summer school enrollment fees 
At elementary and middle school, there is no charge, and also for the credit recovery classes, there is no charge. And we're able to do that with at-risk funds and then also with the federal COVID relief dollars. And because of the, um, the COVID relief dollars, that does allow us to basically put a lot more inputs and structures and supports into place. And so you know, we're really excited to be able to do that um, this year and to have those funds to, to not have any charge at elementary, middle school, or for credit recovery courses. At high school, the, the $110 for elective courses, that's gonna be for your speech, your computer apps one, your computer apps two, and that is a course that students are choosing to take. In reality, our students do have the ability to take all of the required courses that they need during the school year. So this is something that a family is electing to do, and so that there is a fee for those particular courses. The $175 for driver's ed, um, several years ago we reduced that down to $175 and really what that, I hear that's a bargain um, compared to other driver's education courses that are provided um, in, from outside entities. But one of the exciting things that we still need to look at the details and it'll be part of the advertising for driver's ed is that we do have a KDOT grant that may help some families that qualify be able to have um, driver's education um, tuition reimbursement. So we're really excited about that and we'll get lots of information out to our public when we, when we know those details. And then it's $55 for the ACT preparation and so that's really for that instructor to provide that intense and um, preparation for ACT prep. So that was a very quick summary of our proposal for 2022 and then also a review of 2021. And so I would take any questions that you may have. So you said that in the elementary, they might do math, they might do English. It's going to be tailored to them. Do they stay the whole time if they're not doing that? Um, what They will stay the whole time if they're doing both the reading and the math. They uh -huh. will stay that whole time. Um, if they do not, then um, they we adjust the schedule for them. And so there really there's several kind of schedules going on within that. Our elementary director and also the teachers, each uh, spring they look at all the students, they look at how many students we have, and then they kind of tailor what's gonna be happening from that eight to one to fit the needs of the students. So if we have a large number of, of math and not so ma many students in reading, they're gonna adjust that. And so it's something that they look at and build kind of around the needs of the students. So would busing be an issue? Busing is not an issue. What we do is we provide that busing and we provide that busing midway. And that's one of the reasons why Durham is so important in this is because they do have to have some flexibility there with, with what happens. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bender. I think it's, <coughs> pardon me, I think it's an excellent plan and I thank you for your detailed presentation. In the board packet, I noticed that the elementary portion, the director is still to be determined. So I assume Ms. McVeigh is planning not to do that next year. I just want to thank you for your work this last year, Ms. McVeigh. It was a great job. And so thank you, all of you, for the leadership in that. And good luck finding the right person to thank fill you. that hole. Yes. We, she's been with us for a couple of years now, helping us get through. And so she had to make some other decisions this year. As, you know, sometimes, sometimes you know, family gets you and you, you need to help them and support them. And so she has... Um, going to give us all her wisdom, though. I think that we're going to sneak into her files and make sure we have all those details. <laughs> Mr. Gardner. Real, real quick, this kind of ties in with um, what you guys have done, and, and you've done a great job, especially in the summer, to try to help kids get to where they need to be. I know there was some discussion on the funds that we put in and how well our kids are as it relates to other schools in, in the state. And one of the things I did was I went ahead and did some research as well because I don't believe we're telling the full story. Kids in our school district are in some area, in some instances, I'm trying to, to say this without being negative, they don't have all of the advantages that everybody has. And so when you look at that, if you look at the kids in our school district that are, are eligible for free lunches, per se, at South, um, and I'm just looking at the high schools for right now, 53% of them qualify. At Central, 59% of them qualify. So they're not getting all of the advantages of, of possibly having internet at home or, or all of these 
other things or, or the, the education level that they have. But if you look at the, t at the schools that are like at the top 10 and you wonder how they're doing, um, number one has 7%. Number two has 9%. Number three, 5%, 6%, 12%, 7%, 6%. That's what's at the top of that echelon. So they're not in that same situation. The demographics are not the same. And when we start pulling data, we need to make sure that we understand what the data is actually telling us because there's hidden numbers in the data. All of this is public information. We graduate 91% rate of our, of, our, of our high school seniors, 91%. 79, almost 80% of those graduate with a GPA of higher than 2.25. 54% graduate with a GPA of 3.0 or higher. Almost 20% or more graduating with college credit. I don't think we're doing our kids a disservice giving them this. We've got to make sure that when we pull numbers, we know what we're looking at before we start saying we're not doing a good job. These are the stats. The stats don't lie. I think we're doing a great job in educating our kids. And I think that summer school program is doing an awesome job of getting kids who have fallen behind the opportunity to catch back up so that they can graduate. Are we gonna be able to save everybody? No, but these numbers are very, very good. So I commend you and I commend the staff. I commend USD 305, great job. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Just to echo on Scott's conversation, I think one of the things we don't highlight enough, which is a part of summer school and the credit recovery is the fact that we're over the state average in graduation. Um, so good job, Ms. Rector, in that. Well, and one of the things that will, that will come to you as a board and, and to our community is that we will do a presentation later this year where we do go over our assessment data and we do talk about our, our stats and, and we do want to celebrate all of the, the wonderful things that, that we do because these are incredibly hard jobs, incredibly hard jobs for parents and for teachers and for administrators and everybody that works in our school district. So I appreciate your recognition of that. Ms. Simmerman. I move that we approve the 2022 summer school program as presented. We have a motion. Is there a second? Dr. Bandre seconds. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, I don't, you decide. I don't really need one, but I wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to ask that we take a 10 minute recess. Before we move into our discussion agenda, we've been at it here for almost two and a half hours, and I think that'd be a good time. So I'd ask that we take a break and come back at 8.02.
Okay, thank you for the 10 minutes there to catch our breath. I would ask everyone to take their seats, please, so that we can move on with our meeting. The next item on our agenda is with Ms. Rector uh, regarding instructional materials. Ms. Rector? Tonight, I wanted to draw your attention to board policy IF, textbooks and instructional materials, and, and how we handle challenge materials. Currently, the district has two challenges for the book, All Boys Aren't Blue, by George Matthew Johnson. And this book is in our high school libraries. The challenges were brought forth by two patrons from the community. Neither patron has a child in our schools. Actually, rarely we have, do we have any challenges to our materials. So I really wanted to take this opportunity to review policy and to assure you that we are going to do our due diligence as we respond to these challenges. So what I'm going to do for you today is I'm going to summarize the key points of the policy, kind of go through the events in order, and also kind of update the position titles of the individuals that would be involved. And, but you do have the full policy that is in your board packet for reference and further detail. So when we have instructional materials, when they are challenged, basically the first step is that that's brought to our attention. And so the complainant notifies either the teacher or the library media specialist in writing, identifying the parts of the, of the book that they deem objectionable. So, so it starts at basically that first level where, where the material is available, either at the classroom or at the library. Once that um, complaint has been received, there is a meeting that is held between the complainant and so either the teacher or the library media specialist and the building principal. And this is an informal level in this process. And so the challenge materials do remain in place during this initial informal stage and then also during any of the appeal process that's available to patrons. The material is reviewed and discussed in an informal level and the building principal will then make a determination regarding the challenge materials and notifies the complainant of the decision. And really, this is usually where we get resolution and we don't very often see this process go beyond that conversation, that informal conversation between the teacher or the library media specialist, the principal and the parent or patron. If resolution is not um, deemed by that complainant, then that complainant can pursue a committee review of that challenge material kind of at that first level of appeal. So they're appealing that decision that that was made at the building level by the principal. The complainant would complete a USD 305 request for review of textbook instructional materials or media center materials. So they, they complete a form and in that form they outline and in a more formalized process, their concern, what concerns they have, and answer a few questions so that way th that we have the full picture of that concern. And that um, material is kind of considered that request for reconsideration that you see in, in the policy. Within five days of the principal receiving that information, the principal will appoint a building level review committee. And so the building level committee membership is going to be the principal, which will act as a chairperson, the library media specialist, two teachers, and two citizens. Within 15 days of that committee's appointment, that committee will review the material and create a written report of the decision. Within that evaluation, the process for that is outlined in board policy. They examine and evaluate the materials as a whole, not on the basis of passages pulled out of context. So they look at the whole, the whole unit or materials or book, whatever it may be. They consider the district's policy, procedure, and philosophy of selection of textbooks and instructional materials. So they look at the processes and the policies that we put into place to select those materials. They weigh the strengths and weaknesses and form opinions based upon the selection criteria, the appropriateness of the materials to the reading ability and maturity level of the student, the relevance to the curriculum and educational goals of the school. So that's the process that they use as the guidelines for that evaluation. So within that time frame, they look at that, they evaluate, and then they create that written report. That written report then comes to me as the deputy superintendent. It also goes to the complainant, and it also goes to the library media coordinator. If the decision is made to withdraw or discontinue the materials at that building committee level, then the deputy superintendent or the coordinator of media services would then consider 
if that book material stays within our district at other schools. Once a decision has been made by that committee, if the complainant does not feel that they believe resolution has been met or achieved, the complainant is dissatisfied with the decision, a second appeal may be filed with the deputy superintendent and within 10 days of the written receipt of the decision. So once the complainant has that decision, they have 10 days to determine if they want to appeal. Within five school days, the deputy superintendent appoints a district-wide appeal committee to, the, to review the materials. The appeal committee will consist of members not on the original building level review committee, and that committee will be made up of a principal from another school at that same level, and they will act as the chairperson. The deputy superintendent will be on that committee, the coordinator of media services, two teachers, three certified staff members, which can be teachers or media specialists, and three citizens. So it's a larger committee, but none of the individuals on this committee were part of the building level committee. Within 15 days of the committee's appointment, the committee reviews the materials and creates a report, re written report of the decision. So they go back over those evaluation process guidelines, and this committee goes through that process. Within um, 15 days, like I said, they, re they review that material, they create a report, and then that report is provided to the complainant and the superintendent. Once the complainant has that report, if they are still dissatisfied with the decision, a final appeal may be filed with the superintendent within 10 days of the receipt of that written decision. Within 45 days of the receipt of the notice of appeal, the Board of Education reviews the appeal committee report and provides a hearing for the complainant. The Board of Education decision shall be final. So if you think about this process, it starts at the informal stage with the individuals that are, that are involved, either the library media specialist, if it's a library book, or the classroom teacher, if it's the class material. It starts at the school level with that principal. And then if it is not resolved at that informal stage, then we have the building level committee, then we have a district level committee, and then if it is still not resolved, then it would come to you as a school board. I wanted to make sure that we were able to um, report on that procedure and process. I don't know, I know in my history, I have never seen um, a book be actually not, um, excuse me, I've never seen a book go further than the building level committee. Resolution has been set at the building level committee, I think once um, in the last 15 years I heard, and, um, and then also uh, we don't know if there's ever been a time when it's actually come to the full board for review. So when I say this is a rare process, this is a rare process. And I thought it was important for me to go over that process with you to, to make sure that you recognized that the reason that information is not coming directly to you now is because there is a process that we need to follow that you have put into place as board policy. And so that right now, the two books are in the committee stage at the building level. And so just to kind of on a, a little bit of a side note, I would like to reinforce that at any point in time that a parent would like to know what library books or, um, or materials that they are involved with and their student is involved with in schools, you know, to have that conversation with their student, they can actually have their student log in and show them exactly which library books that they, they have checked out because we think that it's very important for parents to be having that communication about what their students experience is experiencing in, in schools because that's kind of where you are able to, to put those things into place that you deem as a parent and to work with with the school system and to, to have communication with us. If at any point that a parent would like to say, they can contact the school and the library media specialist could say, this is what your child has checked out at this time. And so we really do wanna let parents know that there is open communication in regards to what books our students have checked out from the library. But really that conversation starts with that parent and that student there. And so, um, I guess I would answer any questions at this time, but really my main point to um, being in front of you today as this discussion item is just to outline the policy, and so that way you knew where it was in the process and, and then what the next actions would be for you as a board. Dr. Bandry. I noted in reviewing this in the board packet 
that this policy was originally approved in 1982 and has been revised a couple of times along the way. I'm not sure exactly how revised, but in its current form, it's existed since 2001. So I think that's really a testimony to lots of prior boards. I have no idea who the board chair was in 1982, but it, it, it's very appropriate to me to have this policy in place. And the reason I say that, certainly all of us have biases towards the written word. There's no doubt about that. I, there's no point going through mine now. But as a public school system, we have to serve all students, whether we like it or not. And I, I personally like that. I, I'll say that piece. We have to serve everybody. And I appreciate that some people might disagree with an instructional material or a book. This process provides the whole community the chance to review that so that we're looking at it not from one person's perspective, whatever that might be, we're looking at it from the whole community. And that's very appropriate. I, I do want to take a second to follow up on some comments Mr. Gardner made earlier. There's no doubt about that there's been a lot of stuff in Salina about this on social media recently. And I have to tell you, I support our teachers 100%. Anybody that's been singled out in this process should not, should never have happened. So if any teachers are listening to this, I just want you to know that I've got your back on this. You all are doing a great job. I appreciate how hard it is to be a teacher these days with all the introspection that's out there, with all the state and federal guidelines that are out there. And this policy helps protect everybody's back. So I'm glad you reviewed it. I'm glad it's there. I look forward to seeing what the resolution is for the particular book. I might ask a question, Ms. Rector, and I'm hoping I don't put you too much on the spot here, but I can't help but think that, number one, I don't know how many books we've got in our libraries, <laughs> right, which are multiple, but I, I wouldn't, I would think that there's probably a way that books are selected and that it's not just a random grabbing. Is there any way you could give us some enlightenment to that? It, the way that books are selected, actually, it, it's, a, it's a process that involves input from many sources. It involves input from the individuals that are working in our libraries or in our classrooms, and um, they look at what's been reviewed, they look at recommendations, they have professional, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but they have professional journals, they have professional organizations that give them that kind of information that outlines what that book is about or what those materials are about, and how does that material fit into looking at that kind of that holistic aspect of of making sure that we are able to speak to many students and all students. And so lots of criteria goes into that, lots of conversations. We have professional learning community for our library media specialists as they work to, to make those decisions. They do not make them alone. They, they make them from the perspective of getting input from students, from getting input from staff, from looking at the instructional materials, to looking at you know what is out there in in the community and social media in the sense of, you know, we want our students to be prepared to live in the world that they are living. And we have to honor the fact that sometimes we have to look at the professionalism of our teachers, our library specialists, to, to use their knowledge that they have and their expertise to help us make decisions about having a really vital and healthy school library. I would, I would add to that, um, and I, you did a great job describing, th that they do look at reviews and they look at awards that um, different texts have won. And there are, the American Library Association has lists of books that are recommended um, for a balanced library. And our media specialists have extensive training in how do you create a media center that has that balance um, for schools. And so that's part of their training. The, um, there are multiple organizations that do reviews. And there are multiple organizations that do um, give awards to ch both children's literature and to young adult literature, so the kinds of things that they would be considering. And so all of that they would take into account. And I, they really do a thorough job. They spend um, time looking at where are holes in their collection and um, collaborating with each other about, you know, what are resources that we could use to fill those holes. So um, I, have the, I have a lot of respect um, for what they do, and I don't know who it was that said they had no idea how many books. Um, but they have a, they have a, a tremendous um, 
number of resources available in the library for our students. And I think to take great pride in making sure that, um, that they're carefully selecting those. Did you, say, oh, excuse me. Did you say there were two books or was it just one book? There's one book, but we have two challenges oh, for the okay. same book. Okay, okay. I was wondering, okay. I was, uh, you know, I kind of have read some of the excerpts and and read about the author as well. And um, I just didn't know if it was bordering on promoting obscenities to minors. Is this something that has been talked about or is... We, I know the policies, which I, I, I appreciate that, and I'm, you explained that very, very well, but I, I just didn't want uh, the, the district to be in a position where you know, there would be some legal actions taking place. We are following the process and policies that we have within that the board mm -hmm. has deemed us to follow. And so I'm not gonna speak to this particular book or this particular context okay. of this book. And so what our, what our charge is and what my charge is is to make sure that we are following the policy that we're doing our due diligence to look at all of the, the things that they look at for mm -hmm. the evaluation criteria and bringing in those others at the, both the building level and then if resolution is not resolved, then they bring it to the, the district level. I would say, as board members, our charge is to look at the entire book. Yes, and that's part of the evaluation process is to look at the, the entirety of the book and not to pull out just particular pieces. Have you read the book? Okay, is there anything else from our board on this matter? Okay, it sounds like we will follow the process with you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay. The next thing we will get into is school board reports and upcoming dates of importance. Miss um, Schamberg, you got assigned to a committee. Oh, I'm sorry, superintendent's report. I went to the you're, wrong place. You're skipping me. I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, I, I need some, ma'am. Please read the whole thing. Have a seat, ma'am. Ma'am, please have a seat. Please have a seat, ma'am. Ma'am, sir, could you help her find her way? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Exline. Thank you, Mr. President. The, I, just a couple things that I want to update you on. The first is um, Lisa Peters and Shanna Rector and I met with all of the building principals, and each building principal was allocated a certain amount of money out of the ESSER three federal COVID relief dollars. Um, and they did a plan for how they were going to make sure that we were addressing a student learning needs, um, student social emotional needs, how they wanted to use that money to try to address learning loss. And so we have, um, Lisa has actually started to do our application for those ESSER three dollars. And so that's in process. And I just want you to know that her department um, the number of accounts that they have set up for us to be able to track that money, it, it's a stack. <laughs> and I appreciate the extra work that that is on their plate and their, their just ability to manage that. The second thing is we did have a district site council meeting and Shanna Rector's department actually facilitated that. We got some great input, such a positive meeting. Great input from our um, families and community members on that district site council on ways to um, better engage parents and better engage um, the community in meeting students' needs. And so that was very positive this week. I was also able to serve on a CSI panel. We had a group of students at Lakewood that um, solved a crime this week, and they had to present their evidence, and they had um, fingerprints and lip 
um, lipstick prints and um, a crime scene, if you will, with a chair that was overturned. And anyway, it was really fun to be in the classroom and listen to the students and what they were learning and the reasoning skills that they are gaining from those kinds of activities. So I just want to give a shout out to Christy Fritz on that. She was the one that did that, and it was it was really good. And then the Teacher of the Year group was here this week touring our district, and um, I got to give a welcome to the group and share a little bit about USD 305. They toured some of our classrooms, and we were able to show off the great things about our district, so that was very positive as well. And then the last thing I want to share with you, and um, Mr. Dow mentioned this, but we, he, we did have five seniors at Central High in his welding program that competed in the Missouri Welding Institute's annual welding competition. Um, they, did, they did very well. They also participated in a job fair as a real world exercise to learn how to talk to employers. And so, you know, through our CTE programs, we're providing those kinds of opportunities to students, the kinds of opportunities that we heard during the listening session that we really wanted in this community for our students. Um, two of the students did get an open offer for $28 an hour to start after they graduate immediately. Um, and I thought, wow. <laughs> and all of them received $1,000 scholarships. So just some neat things that are happening because we have really creative teachers that are looking for ways to um, provide opportunities for students. So if you see him, um, give him a pat on the back for that. It was fun to hear him talk tonight. And um, he, he definitely deserves that recognition. Very good. Yes, Mr. Dow's uh, made a definite impact. He's had a couple of, or a couple of my students, and uh, they've really enjoyed the time. Uh, so now we'll go to school board reports. I apologize <laughs> for jumping ahead there. Ms. Schamberg, you got an assignment last month at our meeting, and you got to attend your uh, first meeting there. Did you have something to report back to us? Thank you for allowing me to go first. Anyway, yeah, well, last, mo last month, yeah, I attended the KASB orientation meeting with you guys, and um, that was interesting of what to do and what not to do. And um, then yesterday, I attended the Health and Wellness Committee, Yes, and that was so fun because Shannon and uh, Lane and uh, got to meet some people, and they're just so, I am... So impressed with with the more I get to know people on the staff and they're excited about you're so excited about this home this summer school stuff you know and they love doing what they're doing and I, I just appreciate that and it's contagious so and Lane you know she I learned that they were the food thing I mean they order the food and then sometimes it doesn't come in they have to change the menus it's the last minute and and she's just up for it and. Um, Flexible was her middle name, she said, you know, but it was it was just a good and the mental health part And I just enjoyed it and um, And I, I appreciate the all the schools providing all these opportunities for students like for the summer schools and the band You know, I was a music teacher and the choir and going into the KMEA thing, you know That's just important for students to be able to uh, branch out in their giftings and things so Oh, and one thing they said they were going to celebrate the teachers, have some special things going on at the buildings to the teachers need celebrations, as well as the administrators with all they've gone through. So it was a good meeting, and I enjoyed it. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Schenberg. Yeah. Mr. Grant? Uh, I attended a uh, Parson Rec Advisory Board meeting. Um, I don't know that there was much of consequence for this group um, moving forward with tennis project um, and I was unable to attend the CKCIE Board of Control meeting in January, so nothing to report there. Ms. Kosick? Um, I delivered a You Make a Difference award to Jocelyn Arnold today at Salina, High, or Salina South and she's just darling. And I got to attend the CKCIE meeting and one of the neat things that took place, uh, we had it actually at our transitions program so the area superintendents could actually get their eyes on and see what that program is about. Very well done. Good job. And at the Salina Education Foundation, we haven't met yet, but I do know because I'm starting to get information, we have nine lift recipients to look at. And um, I was got an honor to um, discuss the school marathon program at the Teacher of the Year 
um, luncheon. So that was kind of fun to be here and meet all of them. So. Ms. Zimmerman. Yes, thank you. I attended the Equity Council and we discussed the difference between having an integrated school and a school where everyone feels like they belong. It was interesting to hear the remembered experiences by some of the adults who were of people of color and how they felt like they were in the little group of African-American students and they weren't really part of the whole school when they were in Salina schools. Um, that they were their little group, which was better than no group at all, but uh, that we discussed how it would be possible to have everybody feel like they were belonging to the whole group it was an interesting meeting. I did give a You Make a Difference Award to Doug Stein, the head janitor at uh, Central, and he told me that his colleagues lied about him when they said he qualified for this award, but uh, his colleagues disagreed, and uh, we gave him the award anyway. <laughs> he was a character. Um, I did go to see Anastasia at Central, and I was so impressed, and the, the two girls that were the two stars were really just out of this world. <laughs> um, and I uh, did, I finished all of my uh, arts and education things for the uh, Salina Arts and Humanities, and I thank the Salina Arts and Humanities for making that possible. I did 19 Kansas Day programs in the weeks leading up to Kansas Day and two Revolutionary War concerts since the start of this calendar year. So um, it's interesting doing it in a mask. Um, it's hard. Um, I was in a meeting with the NEA Executive Council and uh, it's a challenging time for the teachers with so many absences and not enough substitutes and classes being divided among remaining teachers and um, they, uh, it was a good meeting with Ms. Exline. and I mainly listened. So it was a worthwhile meeting with, between them. That's all, thank you. Very good, Mr. Gardner. Um, actually, I got to attend the MLK program with Ann as well. Um, the choir sang there and that was very nice, very, very talented group of singers. Uh, then also attended the uh, Heartland uh, meeting that I attend monthly. Um, they're experiencing the same challenges that the the high schools and the elementary schools are as far as teachers and parents. And it's not isolated. We, we've got a an issue that we really need to address in some manner. So I'm not sure how we're going to approach that, but we've got to do something different because what we're doing isn't working. So. Dr. Bender? So I represent the board on the Smoky Hill Education Service Center board, and uh, they tend to meet on Thursday when we meet on Tuesday, and that's the case this month as well. So we'll be meeting in two days. But last month uh, at our report, which Ms. Emma will appreciate, uh, they, uh, Diane Mann, who has been the chief financial officer there for years and does a really excellent job, is actively planning towards retirement. That's probably the biggest news. So in turn, SHESC is actively planning the impossible task of trying to replace her. That's why Ms. Peters is never allowed to retire, so we don't have to do that here. <laughs> but that's that's a, a big thing for them, and again, Smoky Hill continues to do a great job serving all of our communities. One of the things that that helps all of our districts, and this, again, remember that SHESC doesn't just serve Salina, I'm, I'm forgetting how many, but there's a large number of schools that, that they serve. And how do these places have enough staff to meet all of the rules, to get teachers the training they need, to just do everything? And that's what Smoky Hill does. There's nine education service centers around the state. Uh, obviously, this is the key one for us, but it's just, it's really an excellent program that I think is doing a great job. Uh, tomorrow, as Ms. Caso alluded, the Salina Education Foundation Executive Committee meets. I'm looking forward to that. Next Wednesday, the full board meets of SEF. And again, Michael Chambers is just doing a tremendous job, not only bringing more funds into the foundation, but making sure the lift program is, is prominent, the number of applicants that Dana mentioned again, it's just a great program. I'm just, I'm just really excited about all SEF is doing. I got to deliver a You Make a Difference award to Ms. Amy Counts at uh, Lakewood. Uh, she happens to be stationed at Lakewood, but she actually is the person who supervises all of the nurses in the district and also was the person who did the lead for all of our return to, I'm forgetting the name now, but the return test to, to play and participate and so forth. 
So she carried a lot of weight for the district this year, and it was an honor to be able to recognize her. Unfortunately, the day I was there, there were 12 teachers out at Lakewood, just given many other discussions we've had. So even Mr. Christman was in the classroom, so there wasn't much of a audience to provide the award, but I did see that the picture we took got in the Lakewood newsletter, and I just want to, again, recognize Ms. Counts. Ms. Kamey had already did so, but just a great job. So. Very good. Thank you. Uh, it's been a very busy month for me, it seems like. Uh, of course, there's the Parks and Rec meeting with Mr. Grant. Uh, we also attended negotiations training, so we're preparing for that next step. I got to deliver a You Make a Difference award to Ms. Pittenger at South High. Um, and then the chamber meeting uh, went to that. Of course, the announcement's been made about the annual banquet there, so that's kind of a nice draw to Salina. But also, there was a lot of conversation about all the jobs coming to town and the lack of housing, as uh, we're, we, we've heard. And I encourage that we promote housing on the northeast side of town, to kind of fill up Oakdale School, maybe, um, as we were going through that. Uh, I got to attend the Shrek musical at South High and then a few uh, wrestling meets. And one of the things that stuck out to me is the work that goes in, and Mr. Upson's gone at this point, but his staff, the work that they put in, and the coaches and the teachers, and, and most people don't realize that, but our buildings open about 6 o'clock in the morning. I know the, the day we canceled because of snow, they were pushing snow at 5.30 in the morning, and Miss Exline, I think you were driving around about 4. Um, but I was there for a wrestling meet, and I think we got done about 9.30, 10 o'clock, and the building was still operating just like it was at full speed. Um, so I think sometimes we, we focus on, you know, maybe the one or two things that we know, but there's a lot of things that go in, and our, the staff does a tremendous job making that all happen. Um, the, the South High Musical Shrek was a, a great musical. I didn't get to make it to Anastasia, but I would really encourage you guys, if you get the opportunity to attend those things and see the talents of our students, out there, that's a tremendous thing. Um, I th think that's all I had this. It seems like there was more, but that's uh, <laughs> kind of where we're at now. So the next item on our agenda will be executive session. We've got a few of those. Looks like the first one is for personnel, if I could get a motion for that. How many minutes? 10 minutes. 10? agenda. Um, I move the Board of Education go into executive session at uh, 8.40 for 10 minutes for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel and their contractual obligations because if this matter were discussed in open session it might evade the privacy of those discussed and that the Board of Education reconvene into open session at 8.50 in the SEC room. Second. We have a motion and a second for Ms. Zimmerman. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. We will be at executive session.
All right, we're back in session at 8.50. Is there a motion regarding executive session? Well, I didn't bring it. Oh, I thought we were going to go to the next session. We did that. Oh. You mean for the next session or for the, what we did in this session? Yep. So Mark's going to get there. something out of that <laughs> 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 Dr. Bandry, do you have a motion? My apology, I thought we were going to do it at the very end of the evening. I move that we approve the early resignation of Garrett Walker for the 2021-22 school year and that we impose the liquidated damages amount as required by the terms of the negotiated agreement. We have a motion. Is there a second? Ms. Casso, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 5-0. We have our next executive session, which is for attorney client. Mr. Mr. President, I have oh, a second. we've got another motion. Second motion. I'm sorry. Mr. President, I move that we approve the early resignation of Stacey Nestor for the 2021-2022 school year, and that we impose the liquidated damages amount as required by the terms of the negotiated agreement. We have a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Grant, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 5-0. I apologize. I'm ready to take my ibuprofen now. <laughs> We've got our next executive session, which is attorney-client privilege. Mr. Grant. I uh, move we go into executive session at 8.53 uh, for, 15 minute, for 20 minutes for the purpose of consultation with board legal counsel on matters which are privileged in the attorney-client relationship which if discussed in open session would waive the, that privilege and the Board of Education reconvene into open session at 9.13 in the SEC room. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 5-0. We will be in executive session.
um, we have no action from that executive session, but we do have another one for safety and security. Mr. President. Mr. Grant. I move the Board of Education go into executive session at 9.15 for 20 minutes for the purpose of discussing matters related to the security of the board or school to ensure that security of the school, school buildings, or facilities, and or the information systems of the school is not jeopardized, and that the Board of Education reconvene into open session at 9.35 in the SEC room. We have a motion. Second. Ms. Zimmerman seconds. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 5-0. We will be back in executive session.
And there is no action after that executive session. We um, do have one more. Yeah, Mr. President, I move the Board of Education go into executive session at uh, 942 for 30 minutes to discuss the evaluation of non-elected personnel because if this matter were discussed in open session, it might be the privacy of those discussed. And that the Board of Education reconvene into open session at 1012 in the board conference room. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. We have a motion. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries 5-0.
soon. All right, we are back from executive session, and do we have a motion? I do. I move to extend the superintendent's contract with Lynn X Line for an, one additional year through June 30th, 2025. That's crazy. Yep. Okay. All right. We've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. We will now be adjourned. Oh, we need a motion. I move we adjourn. <laughs> Mr. Grant. Second. <laughs> Everybody seconds. <laughs> All in favor, <laughs> raise your right hand. All right. Have a good evening. <laughs>